and welcome to USPTO's 2024 Black Innovation Entre Entrepreneurship Program. Thank you for our virtual audience and our in-person audience here in St. Louis at T-Rex. We're so happy that you decided to spend your time with us today. I'm Nathania Ferguson, manager of the Office of Innovation Outreach. My team and I support the mission of the USPTO by developing and delivering intentional outreach programming to support and empower underrecognized and underserved communities of innovators. So we're excited to be here today. A few housekeeping notes before we get started for our audience online. If for any reason you get disconnected, please simply use the link that brought you here and you will reconnect with us. We are not taking questions from our live audience today, but we definitely encourage you to send us your questions and comments to innovation at USPTO.gov and a member from our team will respond to your inquiry. Last but not least, this program is being recorded. So if for any reason that you miss a rich panel conversation, don't you worry, you'll be able to access the information on USPTO's YouTube channel. So a couple of notes because it is Black History Month and I'm super excited. I, first, I gotta give a happy belated birthday to Dr. Jim West, an inventor of the electric microphone. For example, I'm holding a microphone now. So his technology is responsible for 90% of the microphone technology that we're using today. And so his birthday was on February 10th. So a big happy birthday to Dr. Jim West. And we are going to get started to this program and we will have rich panel conversations with trusted organizations, national organizations such as the National Business League, League to talk about the importance of supporting the next gen of entrepreneurs. And we'll also hear a very important topic, access to funding. We know that it's not easy being a black entrepreneur and we wanna make sure that we connect you with resources that will assist you. So now I'm going to hand the mic over to our gracious host, Lynette Watson, who is the regional director of business development program for the Small Business Development Center. Welcome Lynette. Thank you, Nathania. Well, good afternoon, right? Good afternoon. Come on, y'all. I need a little more energy. This is an energy day. Good afternoon. All right. Thank you all very much. First of all, I want to thank the USPTO for allowing us to partner with them on this event. And I want to thank each of you for being here. Uh, on behalf of the T-Rex, we are so glad to have you see our innovation um, uh, our innovation area, a lot of innovation goes on here. Um, we are happy to have you today. And we, I am so excited about the program and what is about to take place. Uh, again, the SBDC, I'm gonna give me a shameless plug real quick. We are located on the eighth floor for all of you that are local Missourians and in St. Louis, please utilize our services because we, that's all we do is help small business start, grow, sustain, and expand. So I thank you guys for being here. And I am so, so, so excited about this programming. Um, and I just wanna throw a quick shout out to Portia Deans, who is not here, who bought this all together for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I get to, I have the great um, job of introducing our next speaker who is joining us from, he said all over the place, but I'm gonna say from the DC area. And that is Mr. Derek Brent who is the Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and the Director of the USPTO, uh, the US, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO as I like to call it. I mean, what, what a, a great um, opportunity for us to have Mr. Brent, with, Dr. Brent with us, is that correct? Mr. Brent with us. So thank you. He just looks like a doctor to me. But thank you, Mr. Brent, for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to him. Again, thank you all for being here. Hopefully, hopefully I won't mess anything up up here. I'm going to use my iPad. <clears throat> I 
Let I don't want to thank you for that that welcome and getting the energy up here in the room. Uh, as she was getting the energy up, she reminded me a bit of my uh, of my pastor when I was growing up. I mean, the pastor would get the energy up, so I feel like I'm like the uh, you know the assistant pastor who would come along afterwards and just you know ask the question: Hath everyone been served? Hath anyone been overlooked? But and all, and true, and truly, it is a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Lynette again for hosting us and and for participating in the program. Big thank you to my friends Natanya, and Sean. As always, so happy to be together. These folks just do it, and they know. I call on them so much. You know, what is it? To those who much is given, much is you know, much is expected. It is, there's a bit of that because they deliver every time and they're wonderful teammates, they're colleagues. Uh, sometimes they mess around and call me boss and I get upset and they know that I do because they're my colleagues and, and, and teammates. I also wanna thank the rest of the team that's here. Mr. Michael Cleveland, as always, always appreciate seeing you, sir. And then other members of our team that are here, got a chance to walk over with my friend James from the Midwest Regional Office. James, it's always good to see you. James is, since day one, James has been a, a, a trusted advisor and, a, and I'm happy to call him a friend. He has helped to keep me, uh, to educate me, uh, keep me focused. Uh, I wouldn't be here without him. So I thank you and that's from the bottom of my heart. So it's a privilege to be here. And I wanna say a big thank you to our friend and our partner here, Dr. Kenneth Harris, uh, for being such a profoundly important leader uh, for black businesses. Uh, it has been an honor to work with over the last year. Now I'm gonna have a gentle aside here. Uh, Dr. Harris and I, uh, in our youth, played basketball. Uh, we didn't play basketball together. I'm sure actually we probably did run into each other somewhere, but uh, we played basketball. And one of my favorite quotes uh, in life is, uh, you know, is earth is a task garden, heaven is a playground. And you know, we used to, you know, we used to play on a playground hours and hours, but now our playground has transitioned. And folks like Dr. Harris, uh, you know, I get to come along for the ride, but we have transitioned from the playground, from the blacktop to a new playground. And that is being out here trying to inspire a new generation of, of business leaders, of entrepreneurs, of innovators, of inventors. That's the work that we're doing it's a playground because it's a pleasure. We're paying our blessings forward. So I'm happy to be on a different playground with you. I'm happy to set the picks. And if you tell me to, I'll pull the trigger, okay? In a few mo moments, <clears throat> the two of us, uh, Dr. Harris and I will sign a memorandum of understanding between the USPTO and the National Business League as we both commit to, as we both have committed to this agreement last November, but we will do the, we will do the signing. The MOU represents a major commitment from both of our organizations to deliver resources, education, and other vital tools uh, to underserved communities and to empower a new generation of innovators and entrepreneurs. Our connection with the MBL that, uh, means that we are leading by example. We're reaching people where they are. We're going to them. And that's the hard work that Dr. And Dr. Harris has done in his tenure at the, as the head of this historic organization. As Dr. Harris knows, patents and trademarks are critical to the success of new and established uh, enterprises. And even after 124 years of assisting your members from the days of the founding by Booker T. Washington, MBL now has a trademark. It's U.S. trademark registration number 7 million, 7 million 281 and 512. And it was issued just a few weeks ago on January 22nd, 2024. So congratulations to MBL. MBL <laughs> has chapters in all 50 states and we are proud that we are going to through, through our organization as well as our regional offices, we are gonna work with their chapters all across this country. Again, the goal of this historic, of the, of this historic uh, joining of forces is to spread the word, spread resources, spread intellectual property, and, and, uh, and to help to lift up a new generation. 
but we're going to where people are. You can't just wait for people to sit back and wait for people to come to you. We already started our partnership with uh, NBL. Some of you may have noticed, and if you haven't, please uh, go look. NBL has posted on its website in the Black, in Black History Month a list of very important Black innovators. It is a wonderful, wonderful story, and it's worth looking. Uh, it's worth looking at. It is impressive. is a tangible. It's a tangible result of our relationship. But quite honestly, it is just. It is just something where you you look and you're proud. You get to see the history, those that came before us. Because remember, we're laying the groundwork for those that come after us. This is, but this shows you where we came from. And I remember when I was a kid, my, my grandmother got me a game. It was called African American History Mystery Game. And I'll tell you what, they couldn't get me to shut up for about a month in school when I was, I was so proud. Tell her, hey, did you know about this? Did you know about that? Finally, my second grade teacher took me. And she said, you know what, you, I, I was already ahead of the class in history. Like I was, you know, she said, I'm going to take you back here for about three weeks, let the rest of the class catch up with you. She said, and you're going to do a report on George Washington Carver. And it was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was wonderful. I still got to participate in other classes, but that was how excited I was. And that's with this, exactly, exactly. And that's with this project, this, 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 this exhibition uh, that MBL has put out and that we're partnering with them on. That's what it has a chance to do is to inspire. And I hope, I, you know, I hope that, you, that as you look at it, you will go out and talk about these folks that were our, our, our forebears. One of those folks uh, <clears throat> is from the USPTO and we're very proud of his story. And that is Henry Edwin Baker. He was a patent examiner and a lawyer who spent three decades compiling the first roster of African-American patent holders throughout history. It's called Baker's List. Henry Baker died in 1928, and his list is still being used by historians today. It is an incredible story. I believe it was caught by the Washington Post. Uh, it was published by the Washington Post, as well as you can find it on our website, the entire story. But the, the, you know, one of the key things to, uh, to remember is that, the, is that the USPTO, at a time when maybe it wasn't in vogue to put something like this out, not only did the USPTO give uh, give doc, give Mr. Baker a chance to do this. They also sent him to the world's uh, the world's exhibition uh, to actually present on. So it was it, he he had contributed incredibly to the rich history of innovation in this country. <clears throat> we all know how important intellectual property is to our country, but I think you know an intellectual property in and of itself. Everybody thinks patents, trademarks, copyrights, but it is the fundamental part of your business. But don't always just think of patents. That first word, United States patent, and everybody kind of falls off after patent. Trademark is important to young to entrepreneurs. It is the first touch that you will have with your customers. It is the way that you define who you are in the marketplace. It is like you're walking into the door of the marketplace to say, here's who I am. So it is important to remember trademarks and also important to remember co uh, copyrights for those of you in the software area. We have a number of great resources and I'm, actually I'm just gonna tell you a quick stat though. If you wanna understand the importance of lifting up underserved and underrepresented uh, innovators, McKinsey did a study and roughly right now about, there's about 2.2% of all entrepreneurs in the country, those receiving funding, it's roughly about 2.2% they're Afri they're African American or black. <clears throat> That's a low number. That's well below the representative number uh, from the census data, right? And McKinsey did a study and they said that if you could just get the representation level up to 12 or 13% where it is with the census, if you could just get up there, this is irrespective of the performance of the businesses, just having these businesses in the ecosystem, trillion dollars to the, uh, to the GDP. So we need to keep creating businesses. We need to keep creating black businesses. We need to find more entrepreneurs. And if you need to know why, I'll tell, I'll tell you another why. Because right now the rest of the world competitive is, is competitively trying to run the race and catch us as a leader. So we need all hands on deck and we need all minds and all inventions, all innovators on deck. To, to build the future. So that is why it is important. Cast a wide net, find innovation where it is, and let's grow these businesses.
we have a ton of resources, but right now we have a ton of resources, which I'm sure you will hear about, you'll hear about today. So I'm going to close my remarks and betray my lawyerly training, which would tell me to just keep speaking until somebody tells me to stop. Um, but now it's time for us to sign the MOU. So thank you very much for your time. All right, Doctor Doctor Harris. Yes, yes. Sir. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yeah, it is. It is great to be here with you, my friend. Uh, you know, Doctor Harris. I think we first time we met, we did an entrepreneurs roundtable to talk about the important issues of of entrepreneurs. Uh, and the person who kind of held the room, uh, you know, captivated the room was Doctor Harris. I mean, tell us what tell us what you're hearing out from the uh, from the business community. In terms of resources needed, what, what, you know, what types of things? Uh, what are some of the successes, though, that we're that we're seeing? And that's, yeah, I think you you have one that you told me about that is really the, the contracts. Well, one uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and while we're celebrating Black History Month, uh, since we signed this historic MOU, I want to give an acknowledgement of our first deputy. Undersecretary for the U.S. Department of uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Derek Brent. So this is actually Black History Celebration itself, uh, and so we're 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 very appreciative of your leadership at this time, um, the tremendous impact that you've made in just a short tenure. Um, I think it's going to be replicable of young leaders coming up since that's today's conversation because you can actually see it to believe it. Um, what we're hearing on the streets uh, in terms of my organization, um, I actually have the luxury of being the 16th national president of the National Business League, which was founded 124 years ago by the iconic and legendary Booker T. Washington. Uh, and this organization uh, comprises of uh, regional offices in Detroit, Atlanta, Washington, D.C., in uh, Los Angeles, California, with our now newly relocated headquarters back home in Tuskegee, Alabama, where we just uh, opened up a new $2 million facility to rebirth this organization into the future. And along with that, we just received um, our first national federalized trademark in the history of the organization because of the leadership of you, Derek, and Kathy, and the rest of your staff uh, to be able to have this now historic legacy to bring back into the future. And I think they hired me, uh, one, because I kind of sit in that in-between group uh, between the elders and also the youth, uh, which I think is important. And, um, and, and why this is important is because we have 120,000 members nationwide. We have... Um, uh, chapters in all 50 states and internationally. We just opened up our international office in Cape Town, South Africa, in partnership with another MOU signing uh, with the Department of Commerce. So we are reestablishing ourselves 
uh, as the original uh, in, uh, entity, as the first and oldest trade association uh, in, in, on the globe uh, in particular. And so uh, this allows for us to have boots on the ground. And what I've challenged as we are relaunching all of our chapters into a new digital platform uh, under secretary is now we're having our chapters led by the next generation of entrepreneurs. And so uh, anyone that is, is 40 and under, I don't like to age folk because we are a nonprofit, we don't discriminate, uh, we don't categorize by age, but we put an emphasis on that next generation uh, to not just wait in line, uh, but to grab the leadership mantle and to get in, in and get involved and engage and lead. And what I've asked the elders to do, uh, those who are of, of wisdom, uh, those who are of uh, a knowledge uh, point to advise the next generation, point out those pitfalls and in, in, in those different areas that you all have been through, through experience, so that we can help this, or, this next generation be successful because there is no success without succession. And that's one thing that we have to get really good at in the black community is to prepare the next generation, not to wait in line, but to step out front and lead. Absolutely. <clears throat> when you hear, you know, when you hear those numbers yeah. of 120,000 yeah. uh, uh, folks, I mean, for us at the USPTO, we're like, we're like, this is great. And these are folks that are, all across the spectrum in terms of in terms of where they are in their in their journey in their in their entrepreneurial journey and we when the, the thing that we want to do is to provide resources we want to provide education support one of the one of the interesting things and I've talked about this I just came from another conference and, and it's something that I think is one of the most beneficial things for all of you entrepreneurs in the in the audience is is keep in mind that you may engage with one part of the federal government. You may engage with, you know, USPTO. You may engage with the with with a, a MBDA part of the uh, Minority Business Development Association uh, agency from the uh, uh, for within the Department of Commerce. Yeah. But what is working now, and what I think is is starting to make it better for for you all for, in terms of engaging with us, is that we're providing pathways we're starting to engage with each other the government is now long no longer working in silos right. i know at the department of commerce you know we call it one commerce we start to we're starting we're engaging across so that we're each talking to each other so that when you talk to one of us we can say hey oh by the way you know great that you're pursuing intellectual property have you thought about small business have you thought about uh, economic development a the agency mbda and by the way, have you looked at at our partners like NBL? Yeah. We are we're able to it, when you lock into one right now, you're able to engage and get further visibility into into other areas. And I think that's what makes it an exciting time because if we can continue to do that, if we can continue to coordinate our resources, it's going to be a force multiplier for you all. Yeah. It really will. And you'll start to find that all of a sudden you're not just picking and choosing from one agency. You're not just hitting up, you know, maybe you're hitting up a grant from one place, but you're able to find resources that can actually help you grow, especially in those initial stages. I mean, the way <clears throat> we were able to connect with uh, NBL because we learned of their of their work with other parts, uh, other parts of commerce. So that's one of the exciting things that I, that I look forward to. Yeah, I, under secretary, I, I think, it, you know, this is the day and age of collaboration, uh, collectivism, uh, working together. Uh, the mindset of, of individual success is no longer relevant in the black community, um, uh, not just here domestically, but also abroad. Um, and, and it, you know, with the significant amount of growth uh, back uh, to our, uh, what I believe is the source, uh, because our story didn't start with slavery. Um, um, and this connection with the USPTO office is critical because when we trace our roots back to ancient Africa, to ancient Kemet, which today is called uh, Egypt, which was named by the Greeks uh, after they conquered Kemet, uh, uh, you will find, uh, that although there was an official patent office, <laughs> all types of trademarks and patents that 
you know, our ancient ancestors uh, contributed to the civilizing of humanity in the world in terms of agriculture, economies, and entrepreneurship. And when I, you know, as a black historian and black economist, um, you know, I can relate that under uh, Deputy Undersecretary to the fact that uh, we see black business growing three times the national rate to over 3.6 million black owned firms. Uh, we know the excitement amongst young people uh, who, if I was in my classroom today and I asked them, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Do you want to work for someone or do you want to own your own business? 95% of the students are gonna say, I wanna own my own rather than being owned by someone else. And even if they work for someone, uh, they have that entrepreneurship mindset in everything that we do as to where we were taught to go seek a job. Uh, uh, what I'm teaching and hearing the younger generation is that they want to create jobs. And, and that is the foundational emphasis that Booker T. Washington taught when he founded the National Negro Business League 124 years ago with self-sufficiency, uh, self-innovation, uh, manifesting your entrepreneurial ideas, bringing it into reality. And I am not surprised that out of the 3.6 million Black-owned businesses, Black women are the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs in the country, regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation, or gender. So give Black women a round of applause. Because uh, Deputy Undersecretary, you know, women are more than just glorified secretaries. If we trace their roots back to ancient uh, African tradition, Black tradition, uh, you'll find that uh, even when foreigners came into Africa, the first business people that they met were black women. Uh, and so we're going back to the source and it's so critical that uh, this innovativeness that's in place, it is now officially connected to the organization that can bring them resources and connectivity in a collaborative way. And I think uh, this partnership is gonna achieve some great results. No, it will. I know it will. Looking at the time, do we need, is it time to move on to the panel? Okay. We're going to take a second. We're going to move on to the panel discussion. Thank you for your leadership. Deputy Director Fred and Dr. Ken Harris. So we just heard a lot of insightful remarks from these two amazing gentlemen. So now we're going to get ready for the next panel where we're going to talk about the importance of building collaborations with national organizations such as MBL to empower the next gen of innovators. So as we are transitioning, I wanna invite Christy Jackson to the stage, director of the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Harris Stowe State University. And also Ariel CEO, Young Biz Kids. So come on up Ariel. And last but not definitely least, Jay Montez Cameron, another Harris Stowe State University student. So please come up to the stage. All right, well, this, this is impressive right here. And, uh, and, and I'm smiling because I know I'm gonna walk out of here inspired and, and full of energy uh, from what you're bringing. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we're going to start with uh, introductions. You, you you met Dr. Harris and I. Uh, Ariel Bivens Briggs. So I'm the so I Ariel Biggs, and I'm the founder of Young Biz Kids and YBK Day, which is an organization that empowers youth age eight to um, 21 to start a business, learn financial literacy, and also um, build generational wealth through the process. Uh, yes, I'm a sophomore at Harris Stowe State University, majoring in business administration with a focus in entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm developing my own business called OV Customs. It is custom uh, shoes that can be made with fabric and things of that nature. We could talk more about that later if you would like. Um, <laughs> and I'm also a Thriving Ambassador. If you've heard of Thriving, the Fortune 500 company, they are partnering with Harris Stowe, and we're throwing an event in our Emerson Gym on 314 Day. So I've been helping plan with that. 
Now I'm going to I'm going to come back to you for for a, a quick question because what I'm intrigued by is I've is one of the things that I, I'm not the only one that believes this. Uh, James and I we went out to we went out to Minnesota. We had a we we talked to a bunch of young students, young young in, inventors. You have to entrepreneurship has to be brought to folks as an opportunity earlier and earlier. And to see someone who is who's in school and is, is becoming an entrepreneur on this, I, I mean, that is, that's where we need to be. And you're gonna inspire people younger than you so that we can start growing. It, we can start growing even younger and better. But I'm gonna come back to you because I wanna ask you, how did you get in, how did you get into it? So, uh, Christy? Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this panel and talk about our work at the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the only HBCU in St. Louis, which is Harris Stowe State University. Uh, but in listening to all of the resources, you know, I will say that I am a product of all of the, the benefit of all of these resources. My husband and I have been entrepreneurs for 20 years in this ecosystem. And uh, we develop through our entrepreneurial journey, asking questions, identifying gaps, not having access to resources. And as we began asking questions, where are the resources? How do we get connected to this? We got invited to more and more tables. And so we acquired more partnerships and relationships and opportunities. And as we learned information, we happily shared those with those in our community and in our network, which led me to this opportunity to serve as the executive director of the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Harris Stowe. And there we offer various entrepreneurial programs, uh, meeting our community of scholars, community members, staff members, where they are. We offer business accelerator programs. We offer access to capital. We offer programs for nonprofits as well. That is still a business. And so um, it has just been a beautiful, uh, we are a startup as well. We started in you know, 2020. And as we are supporting businesses that are developing, we are growing and we're learning right alongside them. And so it's been a beautiful journey, but proud to say that to date, we have graduated 150 entrepreneurs from our business accelerators. And that is, that in, thank you so much. That includes those that are participating in our 10 week programs. Uh, we have our youth ambassador programs, but we also have a virtual community. And we have 600 entrepreneurs from across the nation that are tapping into our resources and setting up time to meet with our uh, business mentors. So we are truly about building a strong community. Listen, that's you know, like 20 years that is, Dr. Harris, you remember from our round table, when you talk to when you talk to entrepreneurs, it's about perseverance, and I, yeah, I see heads nodding up here. It's about perseverance, and a bit, you know. But the other thing that you that that you discussed, and I still remember this distinctly, uh, the the one young woman from Syracuse who was working with the uh, shoes, yeah. the shoes, um, and she was actually in Manhattan. But but it, but is that you ask questions? Like you just kept asking questions as you went along the journey. And that is part of perseverance is making sure you're asking questions, get that knowledge, figure out a way because no one's going, no one's going to figure this out on their own or alone. You're not siloed. So thanks to, thanks to you. Now, Ariel, you were, you were a student in the, in the uh, business accelerator program. Yes. Um, and Jay Montez, this is for both of you because I'd love, we'd love to hear about your journey to entrepreneurship. How did you, what did you see that inspired you? How did you come to, to, to entrepreneurship? So I came to entrepreneurship through my seven-year-old son. He wanted to start a vending machine business. I mm. told him no because he was seven. But then after about three months, he did his business plan. He came back with us, told us where he was getting the funding from, mm. and he started the business. So if you Google now, youngest vending machine owner in the United States, that's my son. And he, right. That is, yeah. But but training him in entrepreneurship, other families from around the United States started to reach out and ask me, how are you doing this with him? And then I started with six kids, then it was 25 kids, then it was 150 kids. Now, currently, we serve 300 kids across eight states. Oh, wow. And, and can you tell us a little how the Business Accelerator Program helped you? Yes, so it helped me to see that it was not just my household, <laughs> that I really needed to do a business model to look at 
everything that we can offer, everything we had accomplished and what we can put in the blueprint to show to other kids and their families on how to build generational wealth and pass down the knowledge at the same time. So that's what it helped me to put it all in order and say that you're not just a mom, you are a business owner that's going to do something to impact the rest of the world. And Jay Montez, how about yourself? What inspired you and brought you to entrepreneurship? Honestly, uh, when I was growing up, a lot of my family always told me that I had a good business mind, I handled money well and things of that nature. When I turned 16 and I got my first job, I was like, I'm not gonna do this for the next 40 years, <laughs> honestly. Um, so it kind of it kind of started there and I was just picking my brain, trying to be creative and just do things. And when I got to college, I had too much time on my hands and not enough money in my pockets. So I was just trying the next thing and one day just shoe customizer came up, I believe on my Instagram page and I just tried it out. Um, it came out pretty well for my first time. I ended up liking it and I stuck with it and hopefully it takes me far. Uh, Dr. Dr. Harris, <clears throat> you know, we just we just signed, you know, we just signed a historic MOU and we talked a, we talked a little bit about collaborations and how important they are. Uh, can you share with us some of the other some of the other collaborations that uh, NBL has engaged with that have been very productive and that are you feel are moving the ball forward? Yeah, as, as I mentioned, uh, Deputy Undersecretary, is that it, this generation is going to require collectivism. Uh, it's going to require us working together. Um, I always say teams win. Uh, the individual mindset is is a wrap. Um, and and things that we have been intentional about um, uh, with Booker T. Washington's legacy in 2022, uh, we launched the uh, first ever National Alliance for Black Business. Um, and we partnered with the National Black Chamber of Commerce, which was founded in 1993 uh, as the first and oldest uh, uh, national black chamber in the country. Uh, we also partnered with the World Conference of Mayors, uh, which are all of the black mayors, not just here in the United States, uh, but across uh, the entire globe, uh, so that we had culture, race, politics and economics um, as a center to now our alliance has grown to over 50 national organizations that we will be unveiling soon. So um, uh, we we are um, enthusiastically uh, about removing the ego uh, so that we can do the work of our ancestors uh, because we can't take any of this with us. Uh, we have to lay the foundation and the bricks and like our ancestors did for us to be able to have this podium and to have the first uh, deputy undersecretary of the USPTO office in place. We have to do the things now so that our 100 year plan manifests itself into an economic freedom movement for black people all across the globe. And that's going to be through collaboration and another successful collaboration. Uh, in short, we just announced uh, for the first time in history, uh, we partnered during the pandemic uh, with the economic shutdowns, uh, with the George Floyd uh, racial unrest that sparked a uh, equity push for black businesses across the country. Uh, and we partnered with Stellantis, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, Toyota, uh, and several other Fortune 500, Fortune 50, Fortune 5 companies. Uh, and we came together to form the first ever National Black Supplier Development Program, keyword development, uh, as we saw that one, we were losing national black suppliers. We didn't have black suppliers of scale um, um, competing for procurement and contracting opportunities. And we're happy to announce that we started a cohort three years ago, we just finished our third one, and we achieved for the first time in history a hundred million dollars in contracts to black business owners uh, through that type of collaboration. So uh, as, as you would allude to, we're more than uh, talk, uh, we're more than uh, uh, press conferences and platitudes uh, with no intentional measurement. Uh, and today is about uh, not talking about what you're going to do,
but talking about what you have done already. So we are shifting to an entirely new mindset, and it's through those collaborations uh, that we are forging this major successful economic movement, not just here in America, but throughout the globe. Doing work. Doing the work. Doing the work. Doing the work. And getting the receipts. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Christy, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the um, about the HSSU ex- Business Accelerator Program? I mean, uh, you know, Ariel gave you <laughs> a great a great uh, advertisement right there. Yeah. But I am tell- But I want to hear more about this, and 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 I wanted to hear about it jealously because I want to be able to talk about it to other people because of its success. Well, we would love for you to do that. It is an extension of the Anheuser-Busch School of Business. And, uh, you know, what we have discovered is that there are so many ecosystem resources that are available. We are just a small chunk of the ecosystem that is providing the support through Harris Stowe State University. But we're doing it differently because we can also add the layer of education. There are lots of resources that are available and we can say, go to the SBA and fill out the form. And we can say, you know, go to legal services and, you know, request the services that you need. But there are times that people need you to kind of hold their hand, help to vet some of these resources for them, to walk alongside them. And that is what we do differently. We are listening to the needs in which our um, entrepreneurs have. We've learned that cohort models are the best because they can continue to grow and thrive uh, in community. We're listening to where the gaps are. Ariel didn't mention that she actually has a trademark, but that was a result of a workshop that we offered. I also have one too, I'm excited. But my trademark came from Legal Services of Missouri, you know, when I was an entrepreneur. And so uh, we offered workshops around trademarks. We had an attorney come in and talk to us about it. And not only do we have, say, come in and talk to us about the resources, we require the follow-up where you get online with our business owners and walk them through the application. And so that's how she uh, got her trademark. And so, you know, it, it is a beautiful thing. You know, Black folks are already innovative. You know, we are already scrappy. We already get it done. And I love what you said about black women in business because it is absolutely true. But sometimes you need the right words. Sometimes you don't realize, you know, I have always been an innovator, an idea person, a maker, but I didn't know that I was a designer. I didn't know that I was a product developer until I got that language. And so we offer those experiences to our business owners. But not only do we do that locally, we also take entrepreneurs globally. We have a global ventures program and we take our scholars and our entrepreneurs. We've been to Paris, we've been to Ghana, we just went to London and we take them to learn about various cultures for exposure, but also connect them directly with black business owners across the globe to help them expand their business. And as we're doing that, They're building those relationships, but they're also learning about trade at an early stage. And so you can kind of build with those things in mind. So we're doing things a little differently, meeting our business owners where they are, creating that safe space and community. Our uh, business accelerator launches March 18th. Uh, we I, come and see me after this panel uh, to access our startup tree information where you can apply for any of our programs. And I forgot to mention they are free. Our, there's there's no barriers. Our, our programs are free. And we also have an 18 credit hour entrepreneurship certificate. And so once you finish the accelerator programs, many go on to get their certificate in entrepreneurship. And we hope they continue on to get a business degree. Okay. I, I jokingly tell this story. A buddy of mine won a bet with me in uh, basketball or football practice something. And we went to eat afterwards. So I had to buy him a burger. And I looked over at him and said, how did that burger taste? He said, free. Can't taste no better. <laughs> Listen, one of the, I really want to draw one point, uh, one point out of this, and, and then I'll make it, I'll make, I want to make a time check, make sure we're okay. Um, but one, one point that you hit on that is so important is the force multiplication of, bring, of the collaborations. You know, we've all been talking, you've heard that, keep ta- you know, we keep hitting on that. Collaborations are force multipliers. They really get things done. And look at, you know, look at how it's it's helping your program. You're not just learn just learning. 
you know, you're not just learning how, how to build a business. You're learning a whole wide range, how to fund your business. You learn a little, you learn about intellectual property. You learn about these things. We have one of our pro bono law clinics, one of our free legal service uh, law clinics. It's in a law school where they took it and they now house it inside of their school of entrepreneurship. So now when you walk in the door and say, hey, I have an idea. I might want I, I, I want to try to get a patent on this. They they say, OK, but we're going to tell we're going to teach you to build a business. Part of it is they give you a stipend to go ahead and do market market uh, market surveys so that you can figure out your customer base so that your invention is getting to the market that it needs. And when you walk out the door with a patent, you're also walking out of the door with a business. So it's programs like this where you're putting together multiple resources that are a powerful, powerful tool for for you as intra entrepreneurs. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I just wanted to also add that piece of investing in our businesses. Often uh, times our graduates really become our vendors as well. And so we have them as priority. And so um, Ariel does a, a market for her um, youth entrepreneurs, her young biz kids market, and she holds that at Harris Stowe. And so we are now partners in that endeavor. And so it is actually a full circle investment. They're learning, but we're also turning around and investing in them as vendors proud thing to give back, isn't it, Ariel? Yes. It is. Uh, no, honey, how are we doing today? Okay. We just got to give this esteemed panel a picture of the dog. First of all, quick, just go ahead and leave the mics on the table. I mean, on the chair, please. <laughs> So before we move on to our next panel, uh, we learned a lot from that conversation, a lot of insight, the importance of making sure that people not only obtain IP protection, but also we're supportive throughout the innovation and entrepreneur ecosystems. A lot of times, as Christy mentioned, we are innovators by nature. We identify problems in our community and we come up with solutions to such problems. So it's very important to realize that. And I wanted to share a slide and maybe it's not showing, but we have a tool at the USPTO. It's called the IP identifier tool because so many times you have intellectual property and you don't even realize what type of intellectual property that you have. So through this tool, take you about five minutes. It's such a valuable investment. It's going to ask you a few questions and then it's going to explain to you what type of intellectual property that you have. Not only that, it's going to connect you to valuable free resources at the USPTO that can help you throughout your journey to obtain the intellectual property that is right for you. So I know we're on time. I think this is just a reminder. We got to have more time for these insightful programs in the future. But now it's my pleasure to introduce Acting Regional Director James Wilson of our Elijah J. McCoy Regional Office to the stage. And we're going to have an insightful panel discussion about inspiration to innovation. Thank you, Jane. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Yeah, when I get a mic. I'm that guy. I'm that guy with a mic. Yes, indeed. We. I want this to be engaging. I want it to be uh, insightful. And I want everybody to relax, take a couple of deep breaths. And I'm going to call my panel members up, some of who I have, some of whom I have met before and I have worked with before. It's 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 a trip. Uh, let me let me share a little bit. Uh, I was here a year ago in this very same room, 
engaging with individuals who were concerned with and interested in uh, small business interests, uh, intellectual property, and, uh, and entrepreneurship and innovation. And to have an opportunity to come back and to be in this fabulous city with this good barbecue is a good thing. It's a really good thing. Uh, bear with me for a quick second while I pull up the individuals in my panel. Terrence Wheeler. Come on up. <laughs> Be strong. Come on up. That's Byron Strong. <laughs> and Mr. Marvin Eugene Thomas. It would be my pleasure if you would come on up. So to start out, I said a little bit about myself. I'd like for each one of you to give me that elevator pitch description of who you are and what your relationship is to intellectual property. What is it that you do? Why are you here? Why are you on this panel? Why do you think that we asked you to be on this panel? And I'm not gonna call on you individually. Y'all grown up, so I'm gonna let you go and uh, I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you decide who's gonna go first. But well, I go first. I guess I'll go first. My name is Byron Strong. I am a um, uh, Air Force veteran. Uh, and thank you for your thank service. You. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, after coming back uh, from uh, uh, serving, I uh, sort of started in, in the insurance business and I'm a, uh, uh, working as an investment advisor and, and have a practice, but start to uh, have different uh, where uh, I've seen other needs where people, normally I'm helping people with their portfolios and people that have funds, have money, but uh, have started to uh, see where there was a need for people that didn't have anything. Uh, and sometimes you're driving by people that don't have anything and we've developed uh, or developing a, uh, a platform that advertises for restaurants and uh, lets you uh, uh, share on that platform with people that are uh, unhoused. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Terrence. What's going on, everybody? My name is Terrence Wheeler. I'm from Columbia, Maryland. And as far as how I got started, I have a, a real, real crazy story. I was selling juice and snack baggies in college, and it was called it's called Liddy Juice. I kind of kind of really stumbled on to entrepreneurship. It was something I was doing as a hobby, but took the really the 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 Hampton Roads, the 757 area by storm at the time. I went to Hampton University. I called it Liddy Juice blew up in that area. And then I decided to professionalize that concept. One person had walked in one day while I was selling this juice and asked me, man, you're going to, you're going to start liquor company or something one day. And <laughs> kind of just rewired my whole trajectory of my brain. And I decided to professionalize this concept. And I created Lumiere talking about five years of development. And the whole, the whole point of creating the brand was I wanted to give vodka specific aroma and taste and character to it. And also without compromising the health conscious benefits of, you know, of being low in calories and something that does not make you feel terrible the next, the next morning. And I was able to accomplish that. We did very well, extremely well. And our first year on market, we did 150 locations and uh, about six, six figures in sales for our first year. So we did really well. And I'm here cause I have intellectual property too. I own two trademarks. Fantastic. Fantastic. Mr. Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marvin Thomas. I'm a service connected disabled veteran from the Marine Corps. I own BFT products. So you I am an inventor. I invent different products. Uh, what I do, I create new and improve existing products. Um, but right now, I'm proud of one of my products, which is a hands-free leveler, which has caught the attention of a lot of different companies. Uh, I started inventing uh, products since I was eight years old. I was eight years old but I was also a baseball fanatic. And you know, I thought I was going somewhere in baseball, but I still had that academic skills in my head where I could come back and fall back on that even after the injuries that I uh, have uh, experienced through my lifetime. And uh, uh, this is what I enjoy doing, inventing things. Thank you so much, thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, we have patents and we have trademarks represented here on this panel. 
And I'd like for you gentlemen to share with us how you moved in the space to arrive at making the decision. I'm not sure whether or not you used the tool that Natanya just uh, referenced to find out what type of IP. And sometimes you find out when you use that tool that there are multiple types of IP that you could use to protect your creations of your mind or your innovations. And so gentlemen, share with us how you arrived at or who, who spoke to you or talked to you or how did you get to the patenting uh, place and the trademark place? We're gonna start with you, Byron. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Two Day Special is the name of our uh, company. And we were really playing off of the, the term uh, that when you go to a restaurant, you're trying to find out, well, what's your Today Special? And, uh, but we wanted it to be a sharing uh, platform. And so uh, we utilized the, the word two uh, and, as days and it was something for me and something that I could share, but we wanted to be able to uh, sort of own that and coin that phrase. And so uh, uh, we uh, actually uh, was invited to uh, a um, event that was at Harris Stowe where we got an opportunity to talk to a, uh, an attorney that uh, did uh, trademarks and patents. Uh, and, and there is where we kind of got on that road and found out that there was a whole lot more than what we thought. And we would actually, we, we needed that professional help to kind of get that part started. Uh, we also had the slogan of find deals, share meals, uh, which we found out, well, that she was asking the question, well, do you want those together? You want it apart? Uh, we kind of had to figure out how to make all that work together. But uh, that actually the help from that, uh, that attorney uh, was, was a, a, a big, a big, a big, a big, uh, a big deal. Thank you so much for that answer, Tom, Mr. Thomas. Yes, uh, I started out first was, I uh, started out with the poor man patent. And the poor man patent is when you uh, develop something and you mail it to yourself and you do not open up that envelope. That's <laughs> called the poor man patent. But as time went on, I got connected with a uh, patent attorney, uh, which was really good. And being that I was a disabled veteran, so it cost me half price to get my, uh, patents, you know, filed. And uh, uh, the, another thing I did was I did patent search first. If you're going to file a patent, first thing you do, do a patent search first on your own. And then if you did it, then you had your lawyer to uh, do a patent search also. Then you collaborate with each other. And uh, uh, ever since I've been connected with this guy, I've been patenting things every year, just about. I got like about eight patents right now. Congratulations. Yeah, uh, and I just received one that I'm really proud of, and that's the hands-free leveling. And that's catching the eye of all the construction world. So there are people in this audience right now uh, with whom I have engaged in other cities who are glad to be in the room to hear how you are going about and what you've done on your IP journey. I'm from Portsmouth. <laughs> I'll tell a whole lot of people that. <laughs> this man went to Hampton University. Are you from Are you from that area? No, I'm from Columbia, Maryland. You're from Columbia, Maryland. I went to Howard. Okay. Okay. <laughs> part of the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the world is small. The world is yeah. very small. So your uh, your trademark. You said somebody came in one day and said something to you and it sparked some interest and it was just through conversation. How did you decide that you needed to protect your brand exactly what you have that is yours? So I like to put everything in the form of a story because I think it's very important to really tell exactly how things came about and then our stories are, are very valuable. I, I always thought my idea, your, well, your ideas in general are very valuable and it's, it's it's important that you protect them because that's that's your creative property and you have to be able to protect it. And I remember the first time I got the idea to even go to an intellectual property attorney, I scheduled a meeting, I went in his office and I sat down and I was like, man, man, what do you, you know, what do you think about this? At this time, it was just a mock-up. I was showing him, you know, what the bottle design was going to look like. I hadn't launched the product yet. Tell him about the concept and I sat down with him and I told him everything. And then he just got real quiet and he's typing type on his computer. He's like, he said, what's the point of this? It doesn't have any value. He said, you're not on the market. No one knows what this is. And you'll probably change it and 
do whatever in the next few years with anyway. And I just, I, all, all the air had left my body. Rattled that, your cage. All the, yeah, all, all the air had left my body and I didn't, <laughs> but I'm the type of person where it, that, that really charged me up. I've, it's just a certain beast to me. It really charged me up and I ended up doing it myself. You fought, to, you fought for your trademark on your own? I did it myself. I did it myself. So let me let me let me share with everyone that we recommend that you get an attorney to assist you. But if you are serious and if you dig your heels in and you learn and you understand the concepts of what it takes in order to do it yourself, it is possible for you to get a patent filing it yourself to receive a trademark, filing it yourself. Congratulations, young man. No, thank you, thank you, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Sometimes others don't see the value in what we value. And it requires that we step out and take care of what it is that we need to in order for us to achieve our goals. What advice would you give a new entrepreneur or a new innovator who is looking to break into the industry. What would you what would you say to someone who is looking to be an innovator and to have intellectual property and to be a business person such as yourself? What does it take? What is it going to take? Uh, what it takes is if you believe in yourself, do it on your own. No matter what nobody say, they say no, you say yeah. That's what I always done. Because believe me, that's the journey I went through. I had people say, oh, that is not going to work. Oh, that ain't going to work. And next thing you know, I got eight patents now. <laughs> I ain't think about what they talking about, you know. Believe in yourself. Get all the help you can get, but believe in yourself. You hear all, you, you say less, and be your own judge. Were there any resources that you use? You say you did it on your own, but I know that you had to read you had to do some research. Were there any any tools or any things that you would share with our audience? It all depends what you are developing, first of all. Now, I, as I said, I'm an inventor. So I have to have things uh, uh, produced or, or developed. It cost me some money. I'm, uh, I'm broke now. I'm just telling like it is. But I know I have valuable uh, uh, IPs. I know I have very valuable IPs. It just takes the right person to come on with you and help you get along. And uh, and I never stopped. I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. I'm motivated when somebody tell me no. That's you. you can tell me no a hundred times. I say yeah, and I'm going to keep going. Even family will tell you no. This, and that is real talk. Depend on yourself much as you can and try to get much help as you can. Don't turn it away. If you get some help, don't turn it away. Don't turn it away, regardless of whatever they tell you, you know. But, I, I, but I'm sorry. Yeah, go right in. Go right I, I in. think it sort of becomes like um, if, if anybody has children, it almost becomes like your child. Uh, it, it becomes a part of you, uh, your business, your brand, how it's viewed by others. Uh, all that it becomes a part of you, and it's sort of like you're raising this baby, and you know you you're very protective about you know who says whatever about it, and you want it to uh, be uh, where you know you know where your parents. Uh, if anybody grew up in you know in a black in a black home, you know your parents were always like you know when you going out, you represent us. You know what I mean? Yep. And uh, uh, you know so you're not gonna go out and embarrass me. You know so it's it was something that you're putting out there, and you don't you want it to be something that's representing you. Uh, and sort of, sort of mine came from my own experience. I'm a, I'm a musician as well. And so the name actually came from my son who called me and said, uh, dad, can you order us some pizza? I was on my way to a, another meeting and I was like, ah, pizza from where, uh, man, we, I got to get to this meeting. I'm, I'm in a hurry. He says, I don't know, dad, pizza's pizza. Who's got specials? And so I pulled over to the side of the road. I'm thumbing through menu after menu. Like, why aren't all the specials in one place? And that's where the name two days special came from. Uh, but but fast forward, I was I'm a musician and I was I was playing at this uh, service and I left the service and Sunday Sunday morning. I had to be at another service that I was in a hurry to get to. And I got in the car 
And uh, um, I hear this voice that says, uh, you do this every Sunday. Uh, you're just going to get to that service. Uh, you're going to tune up the organ. Everybody's going to get excited. If anybody is familiar with the black church experience, you're going to get excited. Uh, everybody's going to get excited about what they should do. Uh, and then get in their nice cars and then leave and then come back again next Sunday and get excited about what they should do. How much is that moving the needle? Uh, uh, and if anybody, like I was saying, is familiar with the, uh, the black church experience, everybody gets happy. Everybody gets excited. Everybody, and you might cry. I mean, you get happy enough, you might even fall out. Uh, <laughs> but, but a lot of times you don't get a chance to translate that into whatever you have learned or whatever you've heard. And so uh, that particular Sunday, I actually didn't go to that service. I detoured. I went to the uh, dollar store and I bought up these three bags of uh, uh, variety chips. Uh, then uh, um, I went down off of uh, Tucker, uh, pulled into um, uh, the McDonald's. I bought uh, 30 to 40 cheeseburgers. Uh, then I uh, was pulling in behind buildings where people were literally in, in dumpsters looking for food. Uh, uh, it was totally improv. I had never done it before, uh, but uh, I, I got out of my car. I, I said, uh, you know, I have uh, uh, cheeseburgers. I have chips. And people were coming up to me saying, God bless you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, then from, you know, from I was from building to building uh, doing that and, and then uh, realized that I had missed this service. I had been out there for so long and I was in tears. Uh, but then I heard the same voice say, no, Byron, actually, this time you were actually in service. Uh, I did the same thing the following Sunday. Uh, three, actually, that, sec that Sunday after that, uh, COVID hit, and I got a call that morning that there was no service. I continued to do that, and that was March of 2020. We still do that on Sundays. And so this has developed out of that. And so it's become, if you're going to do this, you want it to be something personal because it's going to get rough, and it's going to be times that you say, well, why am I doing this? And you got to be able to go back to an experience that you've had to say, this is the reason why I'm doing this. This is why this is valuable to me. All right. All right. So this young man has had dogged determination and he has turned over six figure profits. So you put money into it, people invested in it. How did you fund your business? When I, when I first started, I bootstrapped, I, I bootstrapped about $66,000 to start Lumiere. What and do you mean bootstrapped? Bootstrapped meaning I saved all my money. Oh, oh. I saved all my coins. Oh. <laughs> it, was mine. it was mine. It was mine. I had to use you have you got you gotta have some skin in the game. When you first start, you can't expect to get in front of somebody and talk about them putting dollars into your idea if you're not putting your own resources, you're not putting your own blood, sweat, and tears into what you are speaking life into. And I I remember when I post post grad, I really didn't have that many resources especially for starting a business. I mean, you don't have any money and it's really hard to get a good job when you, when you first get out of school too, even, even with a degree, the way the market is set up. So I, I was Ubering at one point and I was, I mean, I was still in my parents' house at the time, but I took all my coins. I took, I took the money from Ubering and also from my day job and I saved it. I saved it. And I took that money and I kept pitching. I kept pitching. I kept pitching and kept talking about my idea. And then, I pitched about 150 times over about five years. Wow. And I know because I count it. And <laughs> I count it. I got in front of 150 people. I heard 150 no's. And on the 151st try, I got a yes. And oh, I wow. and I went through I went through the bank and I also went through angel investors. I I got in front of people. I kept I kept getting passed through networks and networks and networks. And even if someone said no. Just because I might have been, that might have been just me being in front of the wrong person, the wrong investor. I was looking for a very specific investor for what I was doing. Alcoholic beverages is, it's, it's a kind of a weird niche. And I had, to, I had I understood that I had to come up, I had to come up with this really sick psychological construct in my head of, of hearing no. I had to get obsessed with hearing no until I got in front of the right people to say yes to me. And when I finally got my yes, I never looked back because I already knew once I got that yes, what I was going to do with that yes. And I, I, I made it, I made it happen in my first year. So, mm -hmm. on, so hearing you say that, most people have a strategy that they employ and that they go through. Each one of you sound as though your journey started very personally. You know, it, it, it started 
very personally. On this on this journey, you've had a lot of challenges, and you've had a lot of obstacles. What what would you attribute to yourself that has given you the opportunity and the fortitude to overcome the obstacles that you faced? You might have to repeat that one. <laughs> <laughs> what kept you going? What kept you going? Well, for for me, um, uh, when uh, because this is this is a tech space for me, and I I didn't I didn't come from a tech space, but uh, um, I would um, when leaving the office, and I'm still you know we're graduating from bootstrap mode too, so hats off to people that bootstrap this because uh, that's that's it's it's difficult to do that, but uh, going and continue to see the need, I'd leave sometimes I leave the office and I I not know what my next step was, but then I knew the need that I was trying to serve. And so going and still having those conversations with people that were unhoused, people that were on the streets, and I continued to say there has to be someone that has a voice for them. There has to be someone that is uh, taking this seriously. And, so, and this isn't just uh, what I considered uh, uh, like, a, you know, like you would do a drive-by. And a lot of times you drive by and, and you see a person there, you've already determined the situation. Almost as a person you see that does a drive by on the street or a gang member that does a drive by, they might would have done a, made a different decision had they seen the seven year old on the swing behind them or maybe seen the nine year old on the merry go round. And, it, and so it, I was taking time to spend time talking to people and seeing, continue to see the need to say, oh, there's, I've got to keep pushing, I've got to work harder to make this happen. And you just figure it out as you go along. Okay. Mr. Thomas. Yeah, what I've done was uh, I do uh, in-person presentations. Okay. And my target is, is technical colleges, uh, technical high schools. And uh, when I do these presentations, the first thing they said, can I get one? So that what that does, it motivates me more because I know there, there's a need for what I develop. So that's what inspires me because I know I have something, and these people keep inspired. Hey, I need one. When you gonna have it ready? You know. So that's that's my motivation. Okay. The need and the, the need. desire. Got exactly. For for me, I think it's I think it's two things. I think I'm just wired up a certain way. I think I, go, I think it goes back to just the way I was raised. I remember I went to go find a store. Well, not go find a store. I went to go talk to a store that was near my my mother's house. And I went up there and I was just, you know, I, we were, I was just raised in a very structured way and it was just about figuring it out. It was about making something happen. And I remember I had came in there and I told my mother, Hey, yeah, this, this guy was just disrespectful to me. He didn't, he, he didn't, he let me talk to him. And I drove all the way up here. She lived about an hour away from me. And she was like, you, go, you leave my house and you go back in there and you talk to that man. And that's just how everything was structured. That's how I am. It's just about finding a way to make things happen. And then two, I think I just carry the spirit of success. I think that mm. if when I, even though there's there's also a, a spirit of defeat that always comes after me, when, when things aren't going right or when I can't figure things out, I always remain that spirit of success. And I know after, after I'm done with it, how I'm gonna feel and how I'm gonna be able to impact other people. And so I think that I think that that level of a spirit in me is what kept me going, is what kept feeling me, and you know, it's it's not, it's something that just wakes you up every day. Internal drive. Internal drive. Can I can I say this? I think you also have to be able to envision the end product, uh, even when it's not finished. You got to have in your mind of how this will look when it's completed. So what does so you say that? So my question to you is. When do you know that you have been successful? When when it, when do you check the box to say, I've done what I need to do to be where I'm trying to to be, <laughs> to, 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 to arrive at the point that I'm trying to reach? That journey is never, that journey is never finished. Okay. That, that's, you know. Uh, you there, still on it? Yes, uh, that journey. That, I'm still on the journey. I'm about to be on the journey until I go to my grave. So, 
Okay. Yeah, you know, it's never ending. It's just like I said, I'm an inventor. So I'm coming up with something new every day. And I, I and I follow that path every day. So no, that journey never ends. So it's a lifestyle. It's a life. It, that, that is your life. And you know, that's what I enjoy doing. Some people, that's what they enjoy doing. So that's what they're going to follow. So that journey never ends. <laughs> All right. All right. Oh, so we are, we're not going in order. Okay. <laughs> I, I personally know that <laughs> that is a tough question. I, I personally know that I've, I've been successful with something when I find a solution. It leaves, it leaves me alone. I, I'm always about figuring out how to solve a problem. And I'll go, I wake myself up in the morning in my head. I'm like, all right, I got to solve this, 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 and this. I might not get all those problems solved that day, but I know it's about the small wins. Cause I, I when I first started, I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta do something big. I gotta, I, I'm not, I'm not feeling successful until I've completed a really, really big solution or, or solved a really, really big problem in my business. But it's about the small wins. It's about the small ones. And you gotta, you have to, you have to cherish and you have to feel a sense of joy and happiness over those small wins instead of being obsessed with just accomplishing a big overall problem or objective. And, and I think, I think when you, when you, when you become obsessed with the small wins, you, you manage and you pursue different things within your business because you, you have a sense of joy about coming to work every day instead of just trying to, instead of a monotonous type of routine. I get you. I get you. I, I celebrate the small victories as well. Um, I, I would, I would say, I guess from my perspective, um, it doesn't seem like you're winning unless everybody's winning. And so, um, although you may feel like you've done something, uh, if the other person at the other end of the table or across the table, if they're not winning, then I feel like, you know, from my standpoint, I guess we're not winning unless we're all winning. And so if you're not creating something that helps to benefit or helps to achieve something where everybody can kind of play a part, then it's still more work to do. Yeah, I like that. I want to know whether or not you've had any mentors or if you are mentoring anybody at this point in time. Is there somebody who you're pouring into or did somebody specifically, I, I have an idea about who's poured into you but I'd like to hear you share that. Well, the idea I have that I think once I'm successful is giving back to the neighborhoods. And, and since that I come up in a world of, uh, skills and, uh, 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 what I'm trying to do is start a, a like a vocational training school, something that's needed here. Uh, not only just vocational training, uh, uh, academics is, is just as well important. You need to have academics along with the skills. And uh, a guy I had a conversation with was a fireman yesterday. And he said something to me. He said, man, we need to start a, a fire training in high school for kids. And I thought about it. I said, that's a great idea. You know, because if the guys want to be a firefighter, when they come out of high school, they can do that. Uh, if they want to be in a, a skilled trade job, I right out of high school, they can do that. Because when I was going to school, I'm ancient. So I'm just to be honest, I'm ancient. <laughs> when I was in school, we had vocational training schools. And uh, you was qualified to go straight to a skilled job right out of high school. In the late 70s, they started a desegregation program. That was the worst thing could have happened to the community, actually. Because the kids was getting up at 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning being bust out to these schools, get back home six, seven o'clock in the evening. How are they going to attain any information in their brains and they tired? That's not going to work. But they kept all the county schools, all the county vocational training schools. But we really needed it in the city schools. And that's my plan once this company of mine is off like it's supposed to be, is to give back to the neighborhoods and, and start a vocational training school for these kids, you know right here in the city of St. Louis. I certainly hope that you're starting on a business plan. I am. <laughs> I already got the uh, school program set up and everything. Exactly. I got volunteers. They, they knock on my door down. When you gonna get it started? I say, just wait till I get started. Then we'll work together. That's a beautiful thing. 
That's it. I think he deserves a hand for that, everybody. Uh, for me, uh, mentoring uh, has come really uh, some of my most valuable tips, uh, most valuable mentoring has come from people that are right ahead of me. Uh, sometimes if I look for a mentor that's too far, too far down the road, uh, things have changed too much uh, for where I'm at. And so I reach out to people that are maybe one or two steps ahead of me, and I've got some of my most valuable tips, some of my most valuable tools uh, to put, you know, put together your MVP. That's come from people that were only just a couple. They hadn't gone, you know, too far, but they were just a couple steps ahead of myself. Okay. Now you went to Hampton, so are you? Are you? Are you giving back to Hampton? Are you going back to the school? Are you sharing with 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 young people and young entrepreneurs? Yes, yes. So when it when it when it comes to 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 my Hampton community, I I usually would charge for consulting anybody else. But anybody, whether you're a stu student or alumni, I I don't charge them. I don't ever because I think it's very important to give back to your HBCU. And does Lumiere have millions of dollars yet? No. But what you can do is you can give somebody millions of dollars in advice for them that might change the trajectory of how they might operate, run, or start their business. So I think it's very important for me to give back to my HBC in that way. As far as me obtaining mentors, I went through one of my biggest organizations that I tapped into was SCORE. And I'll always be an advocate for it. SCORE was a huge, huge, huge mentorship network for me. And that's how I got a lot of the really great advice that if I did not have it, I probably would not have been successful as I have been in the development process and then also in the operations process, once the business was started, I had some excellent, excellent mentors. And as far as mentoring to people, I think the, the, overall, the overall goal of mentorship is not done unless you can pass on the vision. So once, once you get the vision, can you share it with somebody? Can you help them? Can you help others see it? And I think once you can share that vision with others, and they can have that same fire to go do whatever whatever it is that they want to do. I think that's when that's when you've been really successful in mentorship, and that's actually been my my model for this year. I want to do more for others than I I did for myself because I I made last year all about myself. So then I, <laughs> I I want to do more for others this year and help people. So on that mentoring and that that mentoring theme, I want to congratulate the three of you for being coaches today, because coaches arrive at a specific place and they articulate and provide assessment. They talk to people about the adjustments that they need to make. And then we move forward when we step back and we evaluate whether or not there has been improvement. And from the assessment of where you are and the adjustments and your journey and sharing that with this body of individuals, I want to say I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of improvement in the business plans, in the engagement with resources that individuals in this community and those who have taken time out of their busy schedule to come here and to hear the, the great conversation that you were able to provide. I, I, I just I just want to commend you gentlemen and I want to give you a hand. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think our time is up. I really, I, you know, they gave me a mic and I get the Oprah moment and I really wanted to take questions from the crowd, but I can't do it. So I want to thank uh, Nathania and her team and everybody who's here and everybody who showed up. Thank you for showing up as the assistant, as the acting regional, I'm the assistant regional director, but as the acting regional director, of the USPTO in Detroit. It, is, it always warms my heart to come to St. Louis and to see the individuals who take time out of their schedule to come in here and to listen to the knowledge that is poured out and that is provided. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, James. So as we're going to transition to the next panel, I think it's very important to think about, not, when we think about the next generation, we all 
we often think about our people in college and universities. So we also have to think about very young innovators in our communities. People are innovating at a very young age. I'm also ancient, as Marvin said, and through my time at the USPTO, I've had the pleasure of meeting many young innovators. We're talking about, as an example, uh, Rosalind and her daughter, Gabby. They identified a problem, barrettes, right? Barrettes are being lost as you're doing the hair. They actually obtained a patent, mother and daughter combo. Her daughter was only seven years old when she came up with this innovative idea. So it's very important that we not just look at our innovators that are in college, but we dig a little deeper down and start making sure that we're providing resources and inspiration to our innovators in K through 12. So I think this is gonna be a good lead in to our next panel. And we're gonna switch it up a little bit, panelists. I'm sorry for the last minute, but due to the format of the stage, I'm gonna call our subject matter resource experts, if you will, to the stage so they can talk to you more about the free resources that are available through the USPTO. So as we were just talking about our very young innovators, I'm going to welcome my colleague, Reggie Duncan from St. Louis, um, an educator and definitely a very, a person that's very much involved in making sure that teachers, parents, and educators get the um, connections that they need to inspire our next generation of innovators. So Reggie. Thank you very much, Nathania. Um, cannot stress to you enough the importance of education. Everybody in this room had a teacher. Everybody online had a teacher, whether that was formal or informal, everyone had a teacher. My first teacher was my father. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but the lessons that he instilled in me are what allowed me to be here in front of you today. Uh, I work in the Office of Education at USPTO, I'm an education program specialist. Uh, I've been blessed enough to do a lot of things in my career, uh, one of which uh, was winning a presidential award for excellence in mathematics and science teaching. It's actually the highest award, STEM award, you can win in K-12 through in the country. Um, I say that to say that opportunity, along with others, are what led me to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So D Deputy Director Brent got me going already, talking about the free burger, because I'm going to tell you something right now, nothing hits like free, right? That being said, we have a number of free resources uh, here for you all. The first I want to highlight is one that brought me here. Because during my time with the Pampst Award, they showed us all these different federal agencies, these opportunities, you can go all these different PDs. And in my time teaching, uh, I was uh, 14 years, I taught mathematics and science uh, with fifth graders. And I'm gonna tell you something right now, uh, it is not easy, right? Uh, especially being a black male. A black male in education, you're talking one to 2% of the population, right? And there's a lot of different hats that you're wearing uh, when you're in that situation. Uh, I was not aware of a lot of the resources that were out there, especially the resources from office education um, that could help that load a little bit. So in the vein of free, uh, one thing that came across my table uh, at the time that I won the award was the National Summer Teachers Institute. And I'm going to tell you something right now. When they told you, oh, you can do these things at NASA, you can do these things here, you can do these things here. All I heard was free trip. And I said, I'm going. I had no clue how much it was not going to change my life, but the life of my students and the life of my colleagues. So last year, we were here in St. Louis. We were at uh, St. Louis University. Uh, we brought about 100 teachers from around the country. Uh, this year, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. So we're going to be in Alexandria at our main campus. Uh, as you can see here, you can go to the QR code. It's going to take you to our main landing page, our education landing page. Uh, it will be one of the first links up there. Um, if you know a teacher or you are a teacher, or you have a child, or you know a child, please share that information about this opportunity. Uh, teachers that are selected outside of a 50 square mile radius, uh, we will pay for their flight, we will pay for the hotel accommodations, we will pay for food throughout the length of the program. Again, if you know a teacher, oh good, I'm glad people are getting their phones out now. If you know a teacher, you know how crucial that is for us. Uh, there are some different um, um, guidelines if you are within the 50 square miles, uh, but that being said, this was truly one of the best PDs I've ever been through in my career. And I'm talking about, I've done them all. I've done PDs where at the end of the week, 
you were expected to fly a single engine plane. This was up there with that. I've delivered PD in the, in the deserts of Dubai. This is up there with that. So please do share that information uh, and change the life of not only a teacher, but obviously changing the life of a teacher, you know you're changing the life of a child. Because at the end of the day, we know your geographic location should not determine whether or not you become an inventor. I will say that again. Your geographic location, your access to resources, who you know, or whose class your child happens to land in, which was something that was very crucial and important for me. I was able to get some of these resources prior to my time coming to USPTO, and I'm telling everybody who will listen. But that's not fair. That's not right because the child's in Mr. Duncan's class, they have access or they know about these different programs at the national level. So that, in that same vein, we have our Equip HQ website. Uh, it is equiphq.org. We'll redirect you. That's kind of the quickest one to remember. But it will direct you to our equiphq.uspto.gov website. Uh, because, again, it does not matter where you are in this country. You should have access to these resources. This is a free, and I'll say it again, free. Like Deputy Director Brent said, nothing tastes good like free. Okay, website, K-12 through web, website, the uh, lessons, everything's grade banded. It's all grade banded. We have lesson plans, games, activities, resources to get your child not only interested, but to get them the skills that they need to be excited about creativity, ingenuity, and innovation in their classrooms, right? I've done this for 14 years with kids in the classroom. If anything, what I see more often than not is creativity being suppressed. You can ask any teacher in this country what had happened in a room full of third graders that got paper clips and you don't tell them exactly what they're supposed to do with them, okay? So we need to take that creativity, give them the tools they need, right, to see that success and also to teach them how to protect their intellectual property. These kids have these wonderful ideas, and they'll say, oh, how can I protect my idea? Well, you can't protect an idea, but you can protect an original work, right? It, stay, it starts with that foundation, and I'm really glad that Nathania brought up. It's not just universities. Yes, our office does offer K-20 through resources, but it starts in that foundation with the students when they're young. We got to get them early, and we have to get them consistently. Right. So that being said, these resources are online uh, for you. We know the importance of representation. We have our inventor collectible trading cards. We're actually going to have some of those back over here. Uh, I actually will be at South by Southwest, I think, what, two weeks uh, from now, giving a presentation on some of our inventor cards. Uh, some of those cards will also be integrated with AR technology. It's coming. Right. So we're in a beta stage. If you want to see a, what I call my party trick, come check us out here during our Meet the subject matter expert, and I'll show you a few things uh, that you can do with those cards. But, you know, when I was a kid, I did not have a teacher that looked like me. Well, it's part of me. I could count the number of teachers that looked like me on one hand until I got to high school, until I got to college. The person who introduced me to the importance of being a mentor and being a teacher and who set me on my path was a black woman who told me the importance of giving back to my community and the importance of helping our students and in turn helping all students, right? So these cards here, kids can learn a little bit about the stories of the inventors. We know the importance of people seeing people that look like them and understanding them. I can do that as well. That being said, we also have our young inventor stories that we want to highlight for you as well. Uh, just like Nathania said, there's seven-year-olds with patents. I taught fifth grade. You tell a room full of 10 and 11-year-olds there's a seven-year-old with a patent, it's on. Right? So it's important for us to share these stories, okay? We have lots of free resources and programs that we offer for you all. Again, you can find us here at the QR code, but you also at uspto.gov forward slash education. And I will be here, obviously, uh, the rest of the afternoon. If you have any questions, want to stop by and we'll get you hooked up. But before I go, NSTI, free, 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 okay? Do want to give that uh, heads up that the application does close March 31st. That's next month. And SCI will take place July 21st through 26th. Uh, and again, in Alexandria. So if you know a teacher, want a free trip, come check us out. It is a very high, highly competitive process. I do want to share that with you all. Uh, obviously, we can't bring every teacher in the country for every cohort. Uh, but please do share that information. If you have any questions, come check me out and I'll get you hooked up. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you. Woo. So we also heard, um, I think it was Marvin mentioned searching, right? 
And a lot of times people don't understand the value of making sure that you get your intellectual property protected sooner than later because we are first inventor to file. We still meet people that say, oh, I'm taking my notes. I have documentation as to when I invented this. That's good for you, but that's not going to be good for you to obtain the protection that you need. So it's very important. The other thing is searching is very important because even for a trademark, you don't want to start building a brand. You have inventory and then you get a cease and desist letter in the mail, right? And they telling you, you better get rid of all your inventory and you better get ready to re-educate your folks. So when we talk about searching, it brings up our next subject matter expert from the Patent and Trademark Resource Center. And when we say free, I have to add this. Oftentimes, I don't know about you all, but when I hear free, I'm thinking it ain't that good, okay? It may be free, but it really ain't that good. But our free resources are excellent, okay? So please pay attention to the next, all of the speakers. And again, we will be around after the program so you can connect with us one-on-one. -on -one. So next I'm gonna bring Eleanor to the stage. She's a librarian at our Patent and Trademark Resource Center near us right here at St. Louis Public Library. Yes. Thank you, Nathania. Thank you everyone for being here. I am so happy to be here. Um, my name is Eleanor Chatterton, and I am the Patent and Trademark Librarian at the St. Louis Public Library. So unlike uh, like Reggie and like the people who are gonna follow me uh, in this panel, I don't actually work for the USPTO, but I'm still a USPTO resource because the PTO has been collaborating with libraries to increase access to information about intellectual property for over 150 years. So let me take you back to 1870 when everything was print and it all lived in DC. So if you had an invention and you wanted to research it, the searching's really important. What are you gonna do? Take a train, maybe ride a horse? I mean, like Reggie was saying, it shouldn't depend on where you live. You should have that access. So starting in 1871, they started sending out copies of printed patents to selected libraries throughout the country. And St. Louis Public Library was one of those. Uh, now as times have changed, so have the materials. So in addition to print, we got some nice microform. Uh, for a while we were getting CD-ROMs. Now everything's online. So, I always tell people start at the USPTO's website, uspto.gov, that's where we start. It's all there. So you might say, well, why do we need a patent and trademark resource center if I can just get to this online? Well, everything is there. It's a little bit overwhelming. And in about the half a dozen years that I've been doing this, I have seen the website, just it just keeps improving. But there's a lot there. So I think it's a little bit like, um, so you find yourself in an unfamiliar, unfamiliar city. You know that it's got everything you need, but how do you find it? Um, now, one great suggestion is to go to the public library. They'll help you for sure. Um, but if you're like me, you're probably gonna turn to that com little computer you've got in your pocket. It'll give you directions, it'll give you suggestions. So I'm kind of like an app on your phone in a way. So if you were to say, hey, I've got this great idea for an invention, how, do, how does the patent process work? I can tell you and I can show you where to go to find that information. If you say, how much is that USPTO gonna charge me in fees? I can show you that fee schedule. Um, if you say, I'd really like to protect my brand uh, by registering my trademark, um, I can show you a preview of the form so that you can be all prepared and make the process go as smoothly as possible. I can show you the trademark database and give you tips for searching. Um, and if you just don't really know where to start, the library is a great place to start. We can have a conversation. There's that IP identifier tool that I've seen up on the screen a bit. That's pretty cool, but also sometimes it's nice just to talk to a person. Um, now I'm a librarian, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give legal advice. So we eventually get to a point where I just can't go any further. And at that point I can direct you to the list of patent practitioners. Um, and I can also tell you about the, the free resources, the patent pro bono program, the law school clinic certification program, great stuff through the USPTO. Um, so 
that is what you can get at a patent and trademark resource center. So I work for the St. Louis Public Library. I work at the Central Library, which is a beautiful and palatial building that's about a five minute walk from where we are right here. Um, and it's a great place to visit. I'd love to see any and all of you there. Um, but if you think, you know, if this is maybe isn't in my plans, I have talked to people on the phone and walked them through the steps to get them to the information that they were looking for. Email's great because I can send links and screenshots. I've had web meetings occasionally with people. So however you want to connect, I am delighted to make it happen. So I can't thank the USPTO enough for inviting me to be here and tell you about the PTRC. I've really been enjoying the panels. And after they're done, I'm really looking forward to the meet and greet that we're going to have here for our people who are here in person. I'd love to meet you. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. So we've heard a lot about brands, right? And that is definitely uh, a primary interest that we learn about when we're meeting with entrepreneurs, small business owners. They wanna know, how do I protect my logo? What does that mean? And I meet people, I will say this, I meet people, they appear like they got all together and they're like, yeah, Nathaniel, I got my trademark, blah, blah, blah. And we look up and it's a TM. So it's like, yeah, you have your trademark, but you don't have a registered trademark. So it's very important for people to understand the difference. And so I'm honored to bring one of our trademark outreach specialists to the stage, Christina. And she's also a trademark attorney. So she's going to share information about the free resources that are available to you to help you protect your brand. Christina? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Christina Calloway. I'm an attorney advisor with the Trademarks Outreach Office at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And we are the office that provides uh, trademark specific programming through live presentations and through online webinars. So we're the office that you can come to for free to request that an attorney come to speak with an organization, whether it be your organization, your business about the trademark registration process, generally about intellectual property and provide that trademark specific programming that you may want to learn about the uh, federal registration process. I also served at the USPTO as a trademark examining attorney. So I was one of the attorneys when you file an application that is reviewing that application. So I do know a lot even about that process and the things that we're looking for when we're reviewing the, those applications. Our mission is to register trademarks. It is not to hold back a trademark or anything of that nature. So we want to make sure that we're providing you with all the resources, these free resources, we'll keep saying that word, so that when you file that application, that application is going to go through to publication and you're going to have that R with a symbol, that coveted R with a circle around it for your registra registered trademarks. Um, if you would like our office or an attorney from our office to come speak to an organization or a group, you can contact us at TM Outreach at USPTO.gov. It will be an attorney on my team like myself, and we'll, we can provide that programming live in person or through a webinar. Um, we also provide many resources, online resources, these free resources that you can access. The first that I'd like to point out is our trademark registration toolkit that you see here. You can um, scan the QR code, or I have the cards in the back here. Just wanna show them to you. And this is going to provide some general information about what a trademark is, the benefits of going through that protection process, and then we can provide you with some basics about the federal registration process for trademarks. You can also access it, access it online. Like Eleanor said, everything that we're mentioning here, you can find at USPTO.gov. That's always going to be your base and foundation of getting that information. We also have those online webinars that you can access. When we provide these webinars, you are going to see an attorney like myself live. It's not like a recorded video that you're going to see. They're going to be live webinars where you're able to ask us questions specifically to the attorneys while we're presenting those, uh, those webinars. We also have our Trademark Basics Bootcamp. This is an eight-week module that you can access that we're going to go through the entire trademark registration process. 
from the very beginning, from the fundamentals, what is a trademark, all the way down to how to protect and maintain your trademark registration after you receive it. It's an eight week module. The next one is starting on April of 2024. You can go to USPTO.gov to register. You do not have to um, accept, uh, attend each of those specific um, modules, you can attend the ones that you feel are most specific to what you're looking for as far as the subject matter. We do provide like one, for example, going through that application process. You can sit down, open your computer, go along with us and actually file your application at the same time while we're going through that and be able to ask the attorney while we're hosting the webinar, any questions that you have about the application process. So that's a free re uh, resource that you can register and go through that process uh, to file your federal registration. As well as we provide just some general information and resources about, like I said, intellectual property, trademark specific resources, about filing and maintenance resources, as well as going through the federal registration process. So we're pro providing all of that for free. And like I said, your base and your start is always gonna be our trademark registration toolkit. I'll be here at the end during the networking session. If you have any questions, say you've start, you haven't started that process and so you wanna know what that process is like. If you don't even know what a trademark is or have an understanding of that, I can explain that. Or if you've already started the process, you started your application, you've received an office action, or you have some experience with that process, I'm here to answer any questions that you may have about the trademark registration process. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. So when we are attending national programs, for example, we were honored to be at the National Business League Conference and we meet people and they're like, we love your trademark videos. We love them, love them, love them. And guess what? I was able to get my trademark without an attorney. So we're happy about that. But we also want to make sure that you're aware of the free legal resources because for me, yeah, I can do things myself, but if I can get something done free, why wouldn't I take that route? So I think this is a perfect time to introduce my colleague, Anand. He is a member of our free legal resource team. Anand, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Nathania. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm gonna, my name is Anand Desai. I'm a patent examiner at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So when you file a patent application, examiners review your application to determine whether you will receive a patent or not. In addition, right now, I'm working in the Office of Enrollment and Discipline, where we manage two resources for independent inventors and small businesses to uh, get free legal services. Our first program is called the Patent Pro Bono Program, and that program is a nationwide resource for independent inventors and small businesses to get matched with patent practitioners, attorneys and agents, to get free legal services to file a patent application or to discuss your patentable subject matter. And what you, what you do is you work with our regional nonprofit partners and they will match you with an attorney if you meet the criteria that we use for the programs in each state. And then the way you find it is by going to the USPTO.gov uh, website as everybody's mentioned uh, earlier today. And, um, you'll find the Pro Bono Patents website. In addition, if you have questions about the program, you can email us. We have an email box where we can answer questions from individual inventors and small businesses at pro bono at uspto.gov. So if you have questions, we can answer your questions as well. So the second program is similar to the first program in terms of finding free legal services, but it's called the Law School Clinic Certification Program. And in addition to being a service that provides services for patent uh, legal services. They also provide trademark legal services. So certain law schools across the nation part, uh, are certified to work in front of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, where a professor is uh, responsible for a class that trains future lawyers, students, law students, to get experience to work in front of the USPTO, and they prosecute patent applications and trademark applications. So they you you could go to this website, the USPTO.gov law school clinic, and you can find there's a list of law school programs that are that are available to uh, inventors. 
and you can um, look to see they're, I, they're listed with the ability to do trademark work, patent work, or they do both. So you can find out what kind of service you want, and then you can ask them if they're available to take your uh, intellectual property applications to see if they can work for you. And so these are two good resources that are available that we just wanna make sure that people are aware of. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be here also for a subject matter um, time period to talk about any questions you may have. We also have a postcard on the table with a QR code so you can have that also. Thank you, Anad. And I know we have a disclaimer on this slide, if you notice, and it says, yeah, the, the legal services are free, but as an applicant, you're still responsible for your filing fees. But there's more good news. If we couldn't give you more good news, I would be amazed, but the good news is just gonna keep happening. So at the USPTO, we understand that as an entrepreneur or small business owner, you're short on resources, right? You're trying to build your product, you're trying to you know, get your market research done, you're trying to do all these things. So we have reduced filing fees for patent applicants. And when I say reduce, we're talking about a bar, we're talking about 80% off, right? So that's a big deal, right? So that's important to be mindful of. Like, so don't get discouraged when you hear, oh, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to file that patent. Well, not necessarily so, because if you're a micro entity, you would get 80% off the fees. So that's significant. So be mindful of that. And one other important thing that I think we should remind ourselves to tell everyone, as I mentioned earlier, we're first inventor to file, but there's more good news. So we have something called a provisional patent application. So when you think of it, a provisional patent application is basically putting your, yourself in line, right? And I don't know the correct fee off the top of my head right now, but we're talking about roughly $100. That application is not examined, but guess what you get? You can go out and say patent pending, right? So you've been in the store, you picked up a product, and you see patent pending. That person is putting you on notice. Don't play around. I've already solved this problem, okay? I'm already ready. So that's very important. When you're trying to get investors, you know, we talk about Shark Tank. They're not gonna wanna invest in you if you're not, you haven't taken the initiative to protect your intellectual property. So just be mindful of that, the importance of filing early. You know, if you have this innovative invention and making sure that you're aware of provisional patent application. And so with that, as we mentioned, we've got an amazing, website, right? A lot of information. I've been working at the PTO for 35 years. I started when I was five, so stop trying to calculate. Okay, 35 years next month. And sometimes I'm like, whew, that's a lot of information, right? But, and it's valuable information, but you gotta know how to get to it. So one thing that we wanna make sure that you're aware of, it's a great place to start. It clearly is entitled Inventor and Entrepreneur Resources, right? And it's got a marketing link. So even if you don't have your cell phone out, it's just uspto.gov forward slash inventors. And guess what? You come to this page, you're gonna connect with amazing people like Christina, Eleanor, Anod, and so many, many, many more people. You're also gonna be able to connect with our regional offices. We know we have James in the house, but we have a large virtual audience online connecting with us throughout the US. So you'll be able to learn about which regional office is located closest to you. They want you to stop by. It's very important, as we say, to be able to meet in person. When we talk about mentorship, connecting with like-minded people, right? Giving you a guide, right? Because there's so many pitfalls and challenges being an entrepreneur, starting your own small business, and you're gonna learn from each other, as was mentioned throughout these conversations. And not only that, you get connected with other people. So I connect you with one person and then another person is going to connect that person with someone else. So that's very important. And on this web page, we don't have thin skin. So we definitely want your feedback. So if you go on here and you say, Nathaniel, I don't know what you were talking about. I was still confused by going here. We want to know your feedback because this page is for you, right? We want to make sure that the information here is relevant and timely. So it is set up so that no matter what stage you are in in your process, whether you're just getting started 
or maybe your more season is even a link to take you to our startup page, which will help you get access to funding, which we're going to have that conversation coming up on the next panel. But it's just so very important for us to make sure that not only we give you an awareness of our free resources, but how to access them. Because if you know about it, but you still can't get to it, it's not useful for you. So just want to make sure that this is a great starting place. So it's just USPTO.gov forward slash inventors. So before we get to the next panel, I got to be mindful of time. I just want to put in a plug that we have programming throughout the year, right? And we celebrate Black History Month throughout the year, if you will, because we bring Black innovators and small business owners to the stage throughout the year in various programs. So as you can see here, this is just a glimpse of some things that we do. Primarily, we're very proud of Invention Con, right? So that is a program that brings all small business owners, entrepreneurs, and creators together. It is typically um, a two-day program. So you're going to hear from people that you can relate to, people that may be in that spot. I think that Byron mentioned you want to connect with someone that's at a similar spot place that you are in your innovation journey is a great place to come. Um, we have Women's History Month company coming up, and that's our Women's Entrepreneurship Symposium. But we also are doing a WE program every month. So we were delighted to be at Hey Days yesterday to engage with women entrepreneurs and show that support. So this is just a reminder that we do this all year round. But not only that, you can access programming. Right. So say for whatever reason, you just learning about us, which you should have already known about us, but you can go to this web page and you can access videos from past events. And there's so many nuggets left from our panelists. Um, we had Stacy Spike participate in Black Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program a few years ago. He um, is the founder of Movie Pass. He's brilliant. He just he just came out with a book. I'm in the process of reading it. Um, so just please check out our events and join us in the future. Um, and then also you can watch a video at a time and place that's convenient for you. So thank you. Are are we ready for our next panel? And so access the Capitol. Woo. Um, oh, what? Yes. Yes, and I think we heard the statistic like 2%, like what? And it's even less for black women, right? So that's, it's like you might as well say less than 1% for us, right? And so we, we know it's not easy. And so I'm delighted that we're able to bring this insightful conversation to the stage. So first I'm gonna welcome moderator extraordinaire, Sean Wilkerson. So he's gonna introduce the panel, Access to Funding. Thank you, Nathania. If our panel can come on up, we'll have a seat. So this panel, I'll introduce myself. I'm Sean Wilkerson, and we're going to talk about accessing funding. And on this panel, we have three wonderful individuals, and I am the only person here who hasn't worked for Stacy. So, uh, <laughs> so we're going to talk about what's available to inventors at different stages during the process, how you can better prepare yourself when you're asking for funding. And I'm gonna start with the panel, starting with Kevin here. Kevin, I just want you to talk about, first introduce yourself, who you work for, and what it is you do for the innovation community. <laughs> so Kevin Wilson, uh, Executive Director of Small Business Empowerment Center, uh, and I work for Stacy. And uh, still work for it, but 30 years I've been working for you in some way, shape or form. Uh, no, but uh, uh, we uh, work primarily in the empowerment zone, helping small business owners uh, grow and develop. Oh, there we go. Is it on? Yeah. Testing, testing. Okay. There you go. All right, that does sound bigger now. Uh, yeah, so we, we work primarily in the empowerment zone and surrounding low to moderate income census tracts, helping small business owners access SBA lending, certification, and contracting. Stacey, you're up. 
My name is Stacey Fowler. I am the SVP for Minority and Small Business Empowerment with the St. Louis Development Corporation, which we call SLDC. We are the economic development arm for the city of St. Louis. Um, and I am responsible for uh, what we call the economic empowerment pillar within our economic justice action plan. And within that plan, I was required to open up an economic empowerment center, which is called the Northside Economic Empowerment Center right next to Sumner High School, which is the oldest high school west of the Mississippi. Yes, yes. We were very intentional about where we went and what we were doing because we wanted to be on the north side of the city to work with the community and the residents that live on that side and provide resources and services to those individual companies and future companies because we help people start, grow, sustain their businesses, and we also work with the community surrounding that. And to support that work, the mayor saw, I knew Mayor Jones saw the importance of that, and she put $280 million aside for us to begin to do some of the work that we are doing on the north side of the city. Thank you. And Todd? My name is Todd Gilliard. I'm the project director of the Missouri MBDA Business Center. We're managed by the Chicago Supplier Diversity Council, and uh, Stacy Fowler is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I am we, not that old. <laughs> we were, <laughs> we work with uh, minority businesses. Three things that we focus on as a center is access to capital, uh, technical assistance, and uh, new emerging markets. We are an agency without um, borders, as you say. Uh, we are allowed to work across the country, globally even. We have clients in um, Belize. We have clients in Senegal, Africa. Uh, and we have clients uh, in in uh, 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 many states across the United States. I, I was trying to name them all, but I'm not. <laughs> and so we, we help businesses grow. We help them uh, get access to contracts and opportunities that uh, just may not be uh, here in the, in St. Louis, but it may be in other states or it may be something federally. So we work with our network of uh, business centers and federal agencies to make it happen. Thank you. So what I want to do with this panel is talk about the story of the inventor. When you begin a process, you have to find resources. You don't always know where to go, who to connect with. And from that point, once you have those connections, you build your session of your story with my business plan, my marketing opportunities. Where do I go for funding? And then once I have that opportunity, where can I go for investors? And that's what this panel is going to talk about today. And we're going to start with Stacy. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay. So the reason he's starting with me is, yes, both of these men have worked with me, but both of their organizations support what we do at the Northside Economic Empowerment Center. And so the center was really thinking about, uh, when we were thinking about what the center would do, we wanted to bring resources into the community instead of always having the community come out, come downtown, come here, come there, go everywhere. So SODC is acting as a convener of services for businesses from helping them with technical assistance, helping them understand how to write their business plan, helping them understand how to do their marketing and their branding. Then you can get it trademarked. I just heard that. No. <laughs> and then uh, making sure that they have what I'm going to call the foundation ready to go before they would go to a Kevin or to a Todd's organization. So if you don't understand these things that you need in terms of your business acumen to make sure that you're really doing business. And so the center's only been open a year, but we've touched 1,100 businesses. We've helped people get their business license. We've helped people get their EIN number because you know what? In our community, we think just because we register our business at the Secretary of State, we in business, right? Yeah, you in business, but you ain't legitimate. <laughs> Okay, let's talk real, right? And so people didn't realize that because they don't know because there's no one sharing the information with them and really helping them understand what it means to be in business, right? And so SLDC was giving money away. We couldn't give the money away because these businesses weren't businesses. They were hobbies. They were in their houses. They were whatever. And we spent a year helping people understand you need a business license. You need an EIN number. You need all these basic things to be a real business. And they were like, well, I don't understand why I can't get the money. I don't understand. Well, okay, 
these are the things we need you to do. But once we put you on that trajectory, now you're beginning to be a business. Now you can go to other places and get just additional resources because they're going to ask you for the same things. And so they were like, okay, I get it now. So that was the first, I think we had like $5 million that we gave away. Then we're, we're sitting on $37 million now that we're working businesses through. But see, they had they worked it out over here so they could come over here and apply for the next pot of money, right? And I will tell you, on 314 Day, five more million dollars going to hit the streets. And there's going to be a revolving loan fund. It's going to be one for contractors who do construction work in the city. And then it's going to be one for profits and nonprofits, uh, for profits and nonprofits for them to access additional capital. So we, we start, but then when they need to go higher or they need things beyond what I'm going to call technical assistance, business acumen, and those foundational things to really become a legitimate business, I hand them off to Kevin. <laughs> so when people come to you, what stage are people coming for information? Are you getting beginners, intermediate? We get everything. Things? So the way we have our, our center divided up, we're divided up into two hubs. We're a contractor hub and we're for-profit, nonprofit hub. We help people start businesses. We help people who just say, I just started, but I don't know what I need to do next. And then we help those existing businesses. And everybody, when they come, they want money. I, even the people who don't even have a business ask for money. I'm like, you're not even a business yet. <laughs> it's like, can we at least make you a business before you ask me for money, right? <laughs> so, but that tends to be the number one question. And so we work with people so that they can be ready. We're massaging them and getting them ready because I consider us to be the social service money because they really want hard money from banks and venture capitalists and other people like that. But you you know, it was a big no. If you go to them when, when you come at the way you came at me, they're not going to even talk to you. So we're trying to package them and help them understand these are the things that you must have from a business plan. When you ask people, well, you got some cash flow? No. You got a P&L? No. Well, <laughs> what bank or institution do you think you're going to to get those dollars? So there are some things that you just have to have. And so through our convening of partners. You know, my favorite story, Stacy, is the guy who parked his car in the middle of the street and just came in and asked for a check. <laughs> He's not kidding. Right down cottage. He got out of the middle of his car, left it in the middle of the street. Middle of the street, coming in because he thought he was going to pick up his grant funded money in the center. We, we have wonderful stories. <laughs> Yeah, well, he knew he was getting it going. So. <laughs> Just come here for my uh, million dollar check. I like so, that. Yes, that. So we work with, we, you know, our model in the center is we do with and not for, which means you have to be an active participant in the process. And we do our doorness to meet people where they are to help them get where they want to go. So someone walking in, what is it you, what is it you need to see and what is it you would like to see? when people come in to be prepared? And if they're not prepared, what services do you offer that help somebody get prepared to move on to the next level? No problem. We want people to come in as their authentic self. Come in being truthful about who you are, where you are, so that we can be authentically helping you get where you wanna be. Uh, so if you think you have, but you don't know you have, whatever you think you have, bring that with you. Uh, like I said, we meet people where they are. We have something called the Boss Portal, which is our business office support system where we have people register. We have them take a mini assessment. And then that, and it just depends on which track they are on in terms of if you're starting a business, we want to know what, what is your great idea? What are you trying to do? What do you want to do? If you've already started your business, well, what have you done? So we can identify what's missing. And then if you're in business, where are you trying to go now? You know, COVID really wrecked havoc on our small and minority businesses in the community. We lost some, and we don't even have the data to really know what the number is, but we lost a lot of businesses. And so we're doing our doorness to sustain and maintain the ones that were able to hang on through that process to help them continue to move at a pace that they can afford to do and stay in business. Because we, as you heard them say, we need these businesses. We need, small businesses makes this world go. And so everybody has creative ideas. You know, 
sometimes we can't give everybody everything they want, but if we can point you to the right direction and give you the resources and the information and know what to do, I think we're doing you the best service we can provide at that time. Excellent. All right. Well, we're going to move over to Todd and we're going to talk about MBDA. And uh, at this time, Todd, can you talk about what type of funding opportunities come from MBDA? So, so MBDA, we <clears throat> funding opportunities, we work with banks. We work, so we run the gamut. And when I say we are, we are agency without borders, we work a lot with CDFI funds, uh, private equity investors, um, banks, uh, we, we, we run the gamut, but the thing about it is they are all over the United States. We even have a, a private equity investor from Europe who is investing in a project that one of our clients have in Tennessee. So we, you know, we, we have, we have investors as far as China that are looking to invest in, in certain products and things like that that we work with. So we, we kind of run the gamut. We, we don't, um, we, you know, we look and see what the client, what your need is, what the niche is. Um, you know, it's just like with anything, you know, we, we, we kind of have a good idea of what our investors are looking, what investors are looking for, what they want to invest in. And then we, we kind of go after it. And so, uh, we work with some, <clears throat> we work with some, uh, banks, uh, like one of them is liquid capital in Philadelphia that works a lot with us, uh, with some clients who may get opportunities, may get contracts, but not have the funds to, to start the contract or mobilization, looking for mobilization money. In some instances, they will give that mobilization money. It's really called factoring, but this, we work with this company specifically because the interest, the interest rates are low or are, are, they're not too high. And then they they work with the individual company to set a plan for them, and they give the money out quarterly. They they look at they assess your business, they assess where you at. Uh, they'll look and say, okay, we'll give. You know, uh, case in mind, we had a client that won a seventeen million dollar contract out of the city of New York to provide products. Uh, we work with them to get the money, but what they did with them was. They looked at the employees, they looked at the shipping, they looked at the branding that they had to do, all of that, figured out what it would cost to run that for three three months. So they gave them that upfront money for three months. Along with that, they helped the company see that by the end of the loan, the company really didn't need the whole 17 million because revenue started to pull in from what they were doing. And so because of that, because they found an easier way to streamline what they were doing and so they were able to cap the money and they didn't have to pay back the whole 17 in most cases so that's why we kind of work with them they there's a special bank uh, but really we we you know we just we just you know i hate to say it but we beat the hedges on trying to get the money for our clients we work a lot we work with kevin a lot uh to help our clients so we just go try to find and get it done so when people come to you, what do you see as the biggest obstacle or challenge that people can't get over in understanding what I need to provide to you for funding? I, I this is this is the thing that kind of like gets. First of all, they think you can just give them money, and they think you're supposed to do it. They think like, no, nah, y'all are federal. You're supposed to give me this money, and and that's not the case. Um, a lot of times, what I think hinders some of the people I see, like I have a client has a really great product and it's but he is a reseller of this product he doesn't invent this product and he wants to get this major contract this major contract is going to have he has to guaranteed shipment of like 34 like i think it's like 3000 units and he has to do this a month and it's going to ship across different areas for this company within this within the united states he sees the money and he wants to jump at the money because he can get the, he, he can probably get the contract. The problem is I said, listen, you need to have, you need to have a letter, a, a, a guarantee letter with your, sit down with your attorney and your distributor got to say that he can provide that because here's the thing. 
our brand is on the look on the hook when we go tell this major corporation, yeah, he can do it, and and we we're, we're advocating for this person. Your brand is on the hook because this is your first time jumping off the porch and doing something this major. So you really need to process and some long and all situations ain't good situations. And so that's hard when you have to tell a company that who wants to grow. And so I, I tell companies, be realistic about your goals. Where's your, you know, I, I look at your business plan. I look at your capability statement. I look at your company CSEP plan to see what you're going to do. What do you have? What do you What's have? a CSEP plan? <laughs> What's a CSEP plan? A CSEP plan, I call it a CSEP plan, but other people call it a different plan, but it's a five-year plan projection for your business. And in that plan, you have uh, things within the plan, COVID hit, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is this. You have to have, those things have to be solid because it, it is, a lot of people think, I'm going to get in business, I'm going to get rich, or I'm going to get this government contract, I'm going to get rich, I'm going to get, and they don't take into consideration the packaging shipping this and the small things so I, I you know part of the job is uh, you know and our team is really being realistic with people that walk through the office and being able to assess where you know what the needs is we have a vetting form with embedded in our application and we sit down as a team on mondays and we'll talk about you know can we really do what this person is asking us to do and if we can't that's why we have straight good strategic partners like Stacy, like Kevin, you know, that we could say, hey, go here, get this, go here, get that. And and when you're ready, come back. Now we're ready to go get this. So, you know, and uh, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Great. So when people are looking for a funding opportunity, when is the right time for them to come to MBDA? Is, is it always, let's go to MBDA or should I be going somewhere else? What makes MBDA the right choice? Um, what makes MBDA the right choice is uh, when you're ready, when you when you have a relation, a banking relationship, when you have a relationship, right? When you when we can look at and we can see uh, based off your company portfolio the things that you have done and the things that you have financed, right? Because by the time you come to us, you're saying, look it's an opportunity in Georgia I want to seize on. Or, hey, I seen this, they, they have this federal, you know, whatever, they have this program and I want to, I want to seize the opportunity. So uh, the good time is where you, 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 all those things, the, the, the basic small things are in place where we could take the package, we can look at the package and we know exactly where to put it. So you did your homework. You're coming with, you're coming uh, uh, like my my friend, my colleague in uh, San Francisco, like to say, you're coming with your company receipts. And when you come in with your company receipts, we're able to see best how to serve you and where to place you and really look at the opportunity for you and then advocate. And I say again, and I always have to say this, we can't make nobody give you any money. We can't make no one give you a contract. Only thing we can do is advocate. And, and what we advocate off of is your company and what you have done and the sweat equity that you put in there, in that company. And so that's, yeah. And do you look at the intellectual property that the company has during this process? Uh, depends on how much money they asking for. <laughs> <laughs> depends on how much money they asking for. Uh, yeah, in, in some cases. In some cases, yeah, it, it depends on, um, yeah, it depends on how much you're asking for uh, and, and what kind of leverage we need uh, to make it happen. Great. All right, well, we're gonna move over to Kevin now. And Kevin kind of has a unique job. I, I learned a lot when we got to talk earlier in our session before. And it, it's interesting because he not only helps people understand what they need, but he goes after the loans for them and with mm -hmm. them. So I wanna talk about that. When people are coming to you, well, first of all, explain that a little more about why people are coming to you and what they need to be prepared with. And then we'll go into how you got the loan. So I'm always uh, asking that question every day. It's like, why are you coming to me? Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah. just, you know, the two minute background of the madness of Kevin Wilson. So, so 
I started off in Stacy's shop, you know, 20 something years ago as senior loan officer uh, doing SBA lending, microloans, TIF, tax abatement, all the things. And so, um, and I think there was this pivotal moment where they started contracting me out to other organizations to do their underwriting for their loans. And I was like, so I thought I worked for the SLE. He said, yeah, you're going to be working for some other people too. So I, I started to understand the complexity of underwriting for other organizations. And then I just started getting people coming to me like, hey, could I get a loan from so-and-so? Like, uh, okay, let me figure it out for you. And so that has kind of been my career since is that we try to figure out where you are right now and then where you want to go and then what's that pathway. I will I'll, I'll be honest to say I can't do what I do without partners like St. Louis Development Corp Corporation, Stacy in particular, and Todd Gilliard at MBDA because and, and Lynette Watson at SBDC because I need those wraparound services that can help the client or potential borrower get the things they need so that we can get them to the lender or funder that can make it happen. And so uh, I, 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 I humbly say that I think I understand what lenders are looking for, and then I can help translate to that to layman's terms so that they can understand the, the pathway to success. And part of what we talked about was, and Todd, were you gonna comment? Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, ditto. Because, you know, having this job, I would sit in Kevin's office and be like, hey, what you doing? But I'm really asking <laughs> questions. I'm trying to ask questions for my clients. And so, you know, he, he, he is the man. He is the man. So let's talk about what people bring to you and how you package that. What is it, what is it people are really needing to bring to you to show that a loan is possible? And how does that packaging help them move forward in the process? So great question. So, you know, when you think about what the typical SBA lender is looking for, and when we talk about SBA loans, we're talking about small business administration, and that is a guarantee that they give to a bank on the borrower's behalf to guarantee the loan to mitigate the risk of doing a deal for you, right? So what we're looking for is the documentation, the information, the patents, the, all the things, all the documentation that is needed to help a lender wrap their head around your deal, right? And then I'm there to help you put it together to understand what you're getting into. So you know exactly up front, like, okay, so I'm, I, I need these documents. I'm giving up this. I'm giving up my firstborn child, et cetera. I got to give a vial of blood. I, I'm going to explain all of that stuff to you on the front end. And then you make your choice whether you want to continue on, right? And then we typically follow through with you to approval, closing, and then afterwards so that, you know, like, okay, so now that you've signed your life away, this is what you need to do to stay in compliance. Because when I was working for Stacy back at SLDC, I used to have to find deals, package deals, close them, and service them. And when servicing, you know, sometimes you've got to liquidate people's dreams. And I don't want that for you, right? <laughs> I don't want that for myself, right? So, so we want you to be as successful as you possibly can when you're going into these financial transactions. And part of what you do, we talk about loans, we talk about grants. But you also deal with tax credits. Can you talk about how tax credits benefit people as a funding opportunity? Great question. So many times tax credits are, um, you know, kind of passive types of things. So, you know, whether that is, um, you know, I focus a lot of my work in the empowerment zone. So the empowerment zone has a wage tax credit that if you are located in the empowerment zone and you are hiring in, uh, empowerment zone, employees, and when I say hiring, not 10 times, they're on the payroll, right? Then you can get $2,000 or more off of your federal taxes per employee. Uh, and so many empowerment zone businesses that I work with can get up to $30,000 off of their federal taxes because they're employing empowerment zone folks, right? But there's also the work 
opportunity tax credit that if you're hiring veterans, hard to employ youth, ex-offenders, et cetera, you can get two, $3,000 off your uh, federal taxes with the work opportunity tax credit. Also through St. Louis Development Corporation, there's the new market tax credits, which can turn into investment uh um which you know we we help guide folks it, that's usually a fairly sophisticated kind of deal where you know you you're doing some real estate development and have you know appraisals environmental assessments you know you have all the things and we can guide you through that process also uh but there's a myriad of tax credits that are out there that can to be fair to say enhance the deal but they don't make a deal <laughs> They're more of an enhancement versus making a deal happen. They will help you bridge the gap. Uh, if there's a, you know, a 25, 10%, 10%, 20% gap in your deal where you need to get some tax credits, some tax credits are sellable and transferable. Investors will buy those from you, things like that. We have even helped some clients who've gotten, you know, uh, lie tech, uh, I should say low income housing tax credit, <laughs> uh, 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 tax credits sell those in, uh, with to us bank and other banks to get the gap that they're missing. So. And when we talk about funding and this is for the whole panel, how do you help people understand in some cases they have to give up part of their company for funding? So, so. <laughs> So I will be the first to say I don't do a lot in terms of angel investment and venture capital. Um, I might have participated in maybe 10 over my career. And that, and even then I was doing probably the lending portion of the deal. Mm -hmm. But what I would say in terms, and I wish Alfred Jackson or somebody who does venture capital was it, it here. But I would say when it comes to giving up ownership in your project or your your business it's from my perspective it's a a, a, a preference mm -hmm. some of my previous borrowers did not care at all about giving up 90 percent of their business as long as they could do their science they said oh yeah i gave up 90 percent of my stock and i got to do what i wanted to do yeah yeah i had a lady who she had a very innovative game that all she had to do is give up 15% of her company for $200,000. And she said, I cannot, do it. I cannot give up 15% of my company. It never launched, but she, it was her choice. And I had other guys who just said, Hey, you give, I get 50, give away 50% and I get a million dollars that I'll do that deal yeah. all day long. Right? Yeah. So it's a preference. You have to understand that once you get over that 51%, you're working for them. <laughs> yep. Uh, and so, but you know, it's, it is a preference, you know? So, so yeah, we, we, we deal a lot with that. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, I kind of agree with Kevin. I mean, some people look at the benefit, you know, if I'm going to get half a million dollars and this is going to get me where I need to be. So, you know, giving up 20% of it and I'm taking 80, that ain't bad. You know, that ain't bad. And then in some cases, they're able to write, you know, uh, you got that 20%, but you don't have, you know, you have no decision making. You have none of this. You, just, just, you know, it's a like a silent partner. Some people don't mind, you know, because the project is still, uh, and I know a couple of projects I, 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 I'm in at liberty to say, but the project is still going on. That person is still, you know, the face of the project is theirs. They make it 80% of the money and the investor took their 20% and getting that 20%. And sometimes it's termed, you know, sometimes they, you work it out and you termed. It, 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 it depends on, on, on you as the individual. And, and in most cases, it, it depends on what you really want to do. A lot of people, when they get to that point to where they're going to give up 20%, 10% of their company to, to, to make this launch, it's usually somebody that has been invested in that company for years and has done everything that they needed to do to, to, to try to finance it the right way and just need this, but they know they have something that is innovative. They know they have something that really is going to be a money maker. You know, it's like, Hey, would I, 
and, and know it's going to be, you know, like this particular company, I know within the first year, they probably grossed probably $20 million, you know, $20 million. And they gave up 20% of that. So to give up 20% of $20 million and you steal a millionaire, you know, it was beneficial for them. And so you have to really look at and say, but, but I, I think sometimes, uh, and sometimes we, we, we tell them, you know, really think about it. You have to tell someone, do you really want to do that? And, and in that case, it's a, it's a lot of times where it's something where it's a here and now type of business. It's, it's something like, uh, I don't know, Chia Pets or something, you know, that, that is, it's popular now, but in five years, is it going to be sustainable? So then you got to have that sustainable talk. What, what you're doing, what's your business, is it sustainable? Can you look back at uh, what, what you are inventing? Is it just five year product and then is 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 done, the wave is gone? Or is this something people are gonna be it's gonna be game changing? And so you have to look at that. Um, one of our newest clients created something that we all use, and he gave a percentage to get it out the gate. And he did it, and we use it right now. It's on everybody, everybody in this room probably uses it and they have it on a phone and and they use it and oh if i could well it's the casting to cast on like if you're watching something on your phone you want to cast it on your tv and you hit that button yeah 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 he created that and he gave up a percentage in order to do that but he created so much more with the percentage that he gave up he was able to take that which everybody still use and he still gets his money but also what he does is, I'm sorry, it's time to go. All right. All right. <laughs> nah. <laughs> but, but, but also, but also, but also the one thing about it is he created a lot of other stuff without, the, with the percentage that he gave up and the revenue that he made, he invented a lot more stuff. So, you know, that's, that's the, yeah, but we, we get that a lot, especially when you deal with equity investors. So James, I, I appreciate you getting jealous of our panel discussion and turning off the lights. <laughs> so time for one last question and we'll just be brief. Nathania's up here with the time marker, but let's just go with what should people come with when they meet with you to have the best experience? What's gonna help them achieve the most when they meet with each of you? So we'll start with Stacy. Number one, they need to know that they need to come with a can-do attitude which means when you come in, you know you wanna do something. We're not there to do it for you. We're gonna do it with you. And you have to have the tenacity and the consistency to stay to it and walk through the process so we can get you where you need to go. Cause it doesn't happen overnight. All right, Kevin. Um, I, I would just add to what Stacy said is that um, understanding this that we I don't have any decision making of whether you get the money or not, right? Um, it is, do you come with this understanding of we are, it is a partnership to get it done and, and our desire for my organization is for you to be successful and that everything we are suggesting, and I will never tell you what to do, I'm suggesting some things, and if you follow those suggestions, it will probably get you to where you want to go at some point in time. <laughs> and Todd, you get to close this out. Um, I say come prepared. You know, come prepared. Everything that you got from Stacy, everything that you got from Kevin, just bring it over to us. Uh, but come prepared. I, I tell people, I say, they should be able to look at your your business plan, your capability statement, and ask you questions. Mm -hmm. it, that's whether you, you're you sitting in front of a loan officer or whether you're sitting into somebody trying buyer. to get a, a buy right or trying to get a contract. They should be able to look at it and know exactly that if I gave this person $100,000, they're going to be able to pay me $125 back. And Ty, can I add this? And, you know, you all can kick me. The buyers, the bankers, the investors know a hustle versus a business. Yes. Oh God. Yes. Yes. Amen. We legitimize hustle every day. <laughs> That's what I do. Hello. 
All right. Just so you know. <laughs> Well, on that note, you can see her after the program at this table. <laughs> I'd like to thank our panel. And uh, at this time, thank, the you, for having the thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank <laughs> you. You want to sit in or stand? Stand. Okay. Don't let it hit the floor, though. Oh. Thank you. Access to funding. Uh, uh, definitely, we know that's a challenge, as mentioned. So we know that you just got a lot of valuable information. And so for our audience online, I just want to give a couple quick, I guess, URLs because we have representation from people that are local, but MBDA, the Minority Business Development Agency, a part of the Department of Commerce is available. They have centers throughout the US, so I'm not sure where our online attendees are, but if you go to mbda.gov, you can learn more about uh, centers that are located close to you. We've heard a lot of reference to SBA, right? And so SBA, actually gives us these wonderful small business uh, development centers. So you can look online at sba.gov to get a lot of helpful information. We've heard mention of a business plan. So that's another great resource that SBA can help you out. I think Terrence Wheeler mentioned earlier SCORE. So there's a lot of, oh my gosh, I've been on SCORE. Because again, I already told you all how long I've been um, at the office. So I'm trying to retire and start my own business one day. And so they have a lot of helpful business um, videos, and they also can connect you with the mentor. So these programs, again, are for you. So on the slide right now, I have a QR code to help us get your feedback. So it's a survey. It's a short survey. Please take the time to give us the information. We will be following up with all of our online and in-person attendees to give you links, because we've talked a lot, right? We've been talking, talking, talking. You may not have a pen and, pay, a, a pen and piece of paper, so we're going to follow up with you to give you links. But in the meantime, please make sure that you take the survey. Also want to share a very helpful part of our website, because again, we appreciate you coming out in person, but there is help no matter where you are. And we appreciate you sharing all this good news with your family and your friends, because we are America's innovation agency. We are your USPTO, right? So we wanna make sure that you're able to connect with us. And so this link will take you to a page that can tell you what's near. We talk a lot about networking, so you can go to your state, you can learn about an inventor or entrepreneur group that's in your area. One more thing, folks, hang on. Um, so we talked about a lot of uh, programs. I know Christina, our trademark expert, mentioned trademark education program. So if you go to USPTO.gov forward slash events, you're going to find a lot of helpful upcoming training. It's all free and it's all amazing. And so this is for you. As you can see, we know you're busy because you may be doing your side hustle, right? So our programs are virtual, so you don't have to worry about, you know, stepping out and coming, greeting us in person. But we appreciate when we are here to meet you where you are, if we do have a chance to connect with you in person. But we offer a lot of virtual program. So just want to thank the wonderful audience, both online and in person. Um, yes, yes. And, and my amazing team of USPTO colleagues is so many of you that have supported us here on site and back at the office. So I can't say all of your names, but you know who you are. We couldn't do this without you. So we appreciate that. And for those of you that have joined us in person, please join us for networking. We have Light Fair and we'll be able to connect you with subject matter experts off to the right. So thank you again.